be better than one, and we'll talk about that after. Um, so welcome. Uh, the main item on tonight's agenda is the MCAS update. There's a few housekeeping things that we're going to take care of first, which is what we always do at the start of our meetings. So the first thing I'm going to ask for, if there's public input that's not already on the agenda, now would be a great time to raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. Mrs. Lieberman. Yeah, um, there's a, a bucket full of leaks at the high school. Are there plans to fix that before winter? Tremendous leak problem at RHS. Uh, okay. We'll absolutely look into it. Thank you. There's a leak, not leaves. There's leaves everywhere, but there's a leak in the high school. Giant leaking water. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll look into that. Thanks. Was there other public input this evening? If you guys can't hear me, I'm trying. So, not seeing none, we'll go into reports this evening. Uh, student report, Mr. Gillis. All right. Um, Mrs. Scarpino's uh, victory bell finally arrived this week. It uh, looks great. It's uh, right next to the field house. It's got a uh, nice brick foundation and the rocket, uh, rocket symbol on it. The uh, football team rang it last week after their victory. Um, You're in town. We'll be uh, debuting this Friday, the uh, drama club's uh, presentation. And uh, that's about it for this week. Thank you very much. Other reports from committee members? Mrs. Browski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a report from the Recreation Committee. Excellent. We have not met since our last meeting, but we did hold a pretty major event, which was the first annual downtown trick or treat. Um, it was a smashing success. We, um, through the generosity of local businesses who worked in conjunction with the Red and Recreation Department, we ordered 500 trick or treat bags to hand out to children who trick or treated in Town Hall and through businesses on Main Street and Haven, and ended at the Senior Center for Cider. Um, we went through the first 500 bags in the first 15 minutes. We estimate there were over a thousand children who attended. Um, there's a debrief meeting next week to talk about it, but it sounds like we will be doing it next year, and it sounds like next year it will be even bigger and better. Awesome, thank you so very much. I did not agree. Other reports, we're gonna save the superintendent's report for the end. This is Wendy, uh, Quickly to say that uh, also that night was the fourth financial forum. Yes. And I believe all of the school committee members were in attendance uh, and uh, administration. So, Dr. Doherty, uh, tonight's uh, main agenda item is the MCAS presentation. I'm actually going to turn it over to Mr. Martin. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Again, sorry for the, the temperature. We have a lot of slides that I want to share with you. So, um, Craig, I don't know, leave those I, open. I know it might, if it's hard to hear, but we should be leaving those open because it's a public meeting. Okay. So I apologize. Thank you very much. Some of the slides will be very quick. Some we're going to linger on a little bit more. What I hope to do is sort of start with a sort of a general overview as we do every year, um, sort of a larger picture kind of drill down a little bit more into a few of the issues that we're seeing, which is, um, we think, key to some of the situation that we're facing right now. Um, kind of give an overview also about how the state's accountability system or leveling system works. Um, and then drill down even a little bit closer, a little bit further down, into some of the specific issues that we've identified and some steps that we are hoping to take, uh, that we have begun to take and hoping to take more in the future. So each year we give an update. I mean, as you know already, I think 
We use the MCAS results in several ways. It's one indicator. It's not the only indicator we use, but it's one major indicator that we look at each year. It, it provides evidence for us on how well particular students or student groups, subgroups, uh, or particular schools are doing in connection to the standards of the curriculum framework. This is especially important to us with the shift that's been happening in the last few years with the state framework. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later as well. Uh, it helps us then to align our programs, our curriculum, our instruction, and so forth. Um, just I think all of you are already aware, in terms of the performance levels, um, individual students then receive an advanced if they receive from 260 to 280, proficient, needs improvement or warning, depending on their particular scores on each particular content area assessment. So as I said, I want to start, what we've done traditionally is we've looked at sort of the exit years at each level as sort of an interview, or sort of an overview. Um, this is great, this is a great projector because the colors are showing up well. This one shows fifth grade language arts, and this particular slide or series of slides are by year. So going back to, um, on your left with the, with the darker blue from 2010, and then closer to my side here is 2014. This is then his grade five mathematics. Where again, um, in the last couple of years, we start to see a little bit of shift with into the needs improvement and warning. Grade five science and technology, one of the things we'll talk about overall is a huge need that we have in science. Um, as you see, I'll go back to the other one in just a minute. You'll see in a few of the slides, um, the curriculum area of science is an issue, is a concern for us that we need some updating in that. So we'll talk about that as we as we go along. Grade eight, English language arts. Grade eight, math. Again, a little bit later, I'll talk about how the state has transitioned over the last few years, and they've done it differently for ELA than they've done in math. And I actually think it's reflected a little bit in these two slides. If I back up to that one again, I think you see we're beginning to make the necessary adjustments. Math, we're still in, pro in progress. And then this is grade eight science. Again, the needs improvement is almost as significant as proficient, which is not the way we'd like it to be. And that's been consistent for several years. Grade nine science, some students take this, this test in grade 10, which is a grade nine or 10 science. <coughs> grade 10 ELA, vast majority of students are scoring either proficient or advanced by the time we get to high school. And then grade 10 math, Again, the vast majority, but even a larger number is in advanced. We saw a bit of a drop off um, in the event this year into the proficient, a little bit into the needs improvement. This is a slide actually from the state website, and this breaks it down. Uh, this is all grades overall. This breaks it down in mathematics by level over the last four years. <coughs> So advanced is in the, blue, in the dark blue, proficient in the light blue, needs improvement sort of in the pinkish, and warning in the darker reddish color. And you can see overall of all of the grades, there's a little flexibility or a little fluctuation, but not too great in the last um, four years. ELA. I want to start looking at, though, one of the issues that I think is a concern and probably a major cause um, with, the, with the level three status, and that's the difference in our aggregate all student group as compared to our high needs group of students. And high needs is defined as students um, in special education, low income students, or ELL students, or English language learners. And as we can see here on this slide, this slide captures all grades overall in mathematics for just this year, 2014. 
and you see these, this is the group of all of our students by level. So advanced in blue, proficient in sort of the reddish burgundy color, needs improvement in green, warning in purple. But then when we take that subgroup out and we look at the high needs group, you see there's a, there's a big shift. A much larger number of our high needs students are, are scoring in the needs improvement or warning level as compared to our aggregate group. In ELA overall, similar, not quite as bad, but in relation to our overall group, still a significant difference. I want to kind of show that in another way because I think this is really a major issue that we're going to be focusing on. This shows the percentage of proficient and advanced in just this year, 2014, but it looks at the entire spectrum from grade three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to high school and grade 10. The blue is the all students group, the aggregate. Again, it's the, it's the percentage of students in that group that are scoring either proficient or advanced compared to that, the reddish bar there, which is the high needs group. In the LA, you see, it is a continual ladder climb, which is the right direction. Still, though, a fairly significant difference. Uh, <clears throat> by the time the students reach high school, it's much closer. One of the things that we'll talk about it near the end of the presentation is how the state calculates this differential between the aggregate and high needs, but it's a key factor in um, determining the, the school's level or district's level. One of the things that, that every school needs to do <coughs> is to narrow that gap. When we look at math, we see even starker difference. <clears throat> Several slides we'll look at over the years, we see that often grade, the grade four and grade eight, we see a dip. They seem to be some of the tougher years and some of the standards in there. But again, there's a huge difference between that all student, the aggregate group, and the high needs group in their, in their achievement levels. Again, instead of just looking at this last slide, if I go back here again, this was just this year with each grade. Now I want to look at just at the same thing, but through the years. So going back to 2008, all the way up to 2014 on this side. This is ELA, all grades. Again, the non-high needs aggregate group is far out scoring the <coughs> high needs group. <clears throat> this one, and we'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about SGP or student growth percentile. I'll explain it real quickly before we get to that part, but the reason that these look a little bit closer is that growth as opposed to achievement, achievement is you know just their score. Growth is showing, well, how much are you growing in that year? If you're growing about a 50, if you're at a 50 percentile. You're growing about the same amount in a year's time as about 50% of the peers statewide, which is about a good, solid, you know, moderate growth, which is what you'd want to expect. You'd want all of your subgroups to be within that 40 to 60 range, right? Because that's about the middle. If you can go above that, even greater. You can see here that both of the groups, high needs and, and the aggregate, the not high needs, are making fairly good progress, but there's still that differential. So this is shifting now to mathematics. The high needs are in the purple. The aggregate is in the gray. Again, you see a difference. And also you see in the last couple years a little bit of a drop that's even more, that's just as significant, perhaps even more so for the high needs group as we've been transitioning to the new framework.
not high needs. needs. Yes, did I say acne? Yes, not high needs. Yep, so this is just compares, comparing the two groups. Yes, thank you. This one again looks at the growth percentile. You want to be around the 50 or greater mark as close as possible. You see how this ranges from year to year. It was interesting, there was one year there in 2009 where overall it was actually equal. As the shift started to happen, actually, actually in 2011 also, and then that was when the new frameworks came in and we're seeing a, a bit of a dip there. So to talk a little bit more about achievement versus growth, I've already said it a little bit, but achievement scores indicate just that. How each student is achieving relative to the standards for that particular grade level in that particular content area. It's determining whether a student is proficient or beyond in that area. Growth, though, indicates a change in a student's progress from one year to the next. Um, for example, the question there, how much did Mary improve from mathemat in mathematics from fifth grade to sixth grade? The state has a pretty sophisticated way of, of um, calculating this year to year by comparing that student, in this case Mary, with academic peers in the state who have scored in a similar range for the last year or so. And they're looking at that just that subgroup of peers and how, in this case, Mary scores in this current year similar to her peer group um, from prior years. So this last bullet here kind of explains it. If Mary improved more than 65% of the subgroup, the peer group that she was with, her growth or student growth percentile would be 65. That's an important measure to us as educators. It was actually a pretty major shift that our state made several years ago. Um, from a teacher's point of view, uh, that's a difficult thing to look at, but it's a much more reasonable thing to look at, especially when you, as a teacher, have students that have a range of abilities. You have students that have special needs. You have students that sometimes start a year with a deficit. As a teacher, I always felt that you know, the number one pri priority for me was not to make sure necessarily that every student clear a particular bar. Because depending on the individual needs of that, of that child, that bar may be unattainable that given year. But I needed to make sure as a teacher that every single one of my students made significant growth that year. A good year or more's growth in that particular calendar year, that particular school year. Um, so to make judgments on a particular teacher or a particular grade level or a particular school or district based on every student clearing a bar, which was kind of the old AYP model, seemed to not include some of the very important variables that teachers face in, in a classroom. Because in other words, a student could start as a deficit, have a teacher make tremendous growth, but still not be ready to clear that bar, but they could be ready in the next year or the year after that. So that was an important change. It's important to remember that it's distinct from achievement. In other words, it's very possible, as I'm saying, for a student who um, is, has a low achievement score still, could have made tremendous growth that year, or vice versa is also possible. A student could make um, very low growth, but still be scoring very high in the achievement level. In some ways, as a matter of fact, the higher your achievement level, it can be more difficult to make tremendous growth. In some cases, I know as we've looked at data, for students that have tremendously high scores, especially that are already in the advanced level, there are so few questions that some of those students are actually missing that getting another question or two or three correct can make a pretty significant difference in their growth percentile. It's also very specific to that subject, grade, and year. Okay. So a student's growth percent could be different from year to year. It can be di different in ELA than it is in math and, you know, or in science. Any questions about that? Is that yes, I'm you. So that means that, so actually you want low growth because you want everybody at a high level. Right? So why would you want high growth? Oh. Both are, both are, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what you want. Ultimately, yeah, yes. Hard. Although we're looking at, the state is looking at both. Yeah, I know. And perhaps yeah, because ultimately we know that not every student is achieving at the high level. Understand. But in general, your goal should be yeah. Well, we look at some of the scatter plots, you'll see that for some of the okay. populations or schools that are already in high growth, 
it is very or high right. achievement, it's difficult to make yeah, that higher. Yeah, yeah. I kind of already answered this why measured growth. Uh, so we put a chart together that kind of shows it over the years. So this is the SGP, the median SGP for these particular grade levels in both ELA and math for 2011, 2012, 13, and 14. See for the elementary grades, three, four, and five. The last couple of years that we've been making the switch to the new framework, we've seen a little bit of a drop in the growth. Actually, this year, a little bit larger drop in the growth. I was glad to see this year at the middle grades, in six, seven, and eight, we're starting to see that correct itself back in the other direction, especially after a fairly significant drop in the eighth grade that pretty much now the SGP is getting back to where it was. We're hoping to continue that and reaching back again up into that 50 to 60 range. Again, the, the, the high school SGP tends to be a little bit lower for exactly the reason that you were, you were stating. So we'll, we'll look at that more in a minute. So I want to show you just a series of uh, some plots here. And these, this is from the state. So essentially, this grid, if we break that up into those six different blocks, so the top part represents, oh, let me start in the middle. So the median SGP, as I said, you want to be in that sort of median or middle range, the 40 to 60, right? That's a good, strong growth for that year. If you're to the right of that, it's higher growth. That's great. To the left of that 40 line, that's lower growth. Then looking at it vertically, if you're above that 50% uh, range, that's showing higher growth, that 50% or more of the students are, are receiving high scores. Clearly, the upper right, that's really the magic land that's sort of hard to, hard to get to, to as, you, as you pointed out, sort of to kind of have higher growth and higher achievement both. So to be sort of in that middle region at the top and as far to the right as possible, where we want to be. So this particular one breaks down ELA <laughs> by all grades. And you see the different colors here. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or eight and ten at the high school. You can see that we don't include grade three in growth because it's the first year. So growth, to calculate that, you need at least two years. This is what math looks like. All grades. Each color is a different grade. That one up there that's very high achievement but low growth is the high school. I should have pointed out, by the way, that the X is the, uh, somewhere it indicates it on here, but I'm this on there. It's the state, uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm pretty sure that's the state. It's on the, it's the state. Yeah, so it's the, it's the state figures in, that, in this particular content. So this is math by school, all grades. So again, the light green one there is the high school. All the reds look the same. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> Jump up there, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, uh, Oh, here it is. Yeah, I need to look at the. Uh, so, um, what's the one that the one that's the Yes. Yes. So this one that you look at the left, that's E right there, because it looks like the SGP is 41, which is right where that is. Mr. Martin, if I could, if I could uh, interject for one second. Yep. I should have maybe asked at the beginning. 
If I could just see a show of hands, uh, families from Josh Wheaton. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll make sure as we go through the presentation, we point out the people's number. But no, you don't get to say it's all. <laughs> <laughs> what was that demo from? You know, on this slide, I did want to put out Caleb and Josh Eaton have pretty much the same mash, and it's all Josh Eaton here. And yeah. this is we. <laughs> this is this is this the Elaine. I think that's Caleb right there. The next, yeah. Oh, and Barrows too. It's just that our SDPs were yeah. yeah. right. our growth is low. But if our if our achievement was higher before, then our growth should naturally be lower. That's what does last year's achievement look like? Last year's achievement? Yeah. That was on the other. Um, but, but not versus the other schools. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have that in this slide. I have to break it down. I might have it on a different slide. Okay, so Mr. Roberts, as you go, if, if there are these kind of color charts, especially with me, I have to work color as well. Yep. You can point out the school that comes to Okay. Thank you. This one actually breaks down mathematics by race or ethnicity. The gold is African American, black. The, what is that, like a grayish tone is Asian. Darker green, Hispanic, Latino. A mid level green, multi race, non Hispanic, and then white. And this is broken down, this is redding broken down? This is red, this is redding. All the numbers are on the right. Look at 31, 34, 50. The state is yes. the X. The state is the X. Yep. This is the same thing, but this time ELA, English Language Arts. And again, preferably, we want to be in this section, preferably above the X or to the right of the X as much as possible, but if we're in this section, pretty good. The next couple are our high needs groups, and here you'll see a difference again. So um, the, the goal here is the non-high needs. This is English language arts, all grades. This is the high needs subgroup. And then this is math, and this is where you see, I think, probably the starkest difference between the high needs and non-high needs. The non-high needs is sort of right in the middle where we want it to be, well above the state's X, while our high needs group is, which is what we're looking at here with the state X, below and to the left. Just, just, just you know, that's 459 students. Someone yeah, so there's, there's the raw it number, so we can do the quick percentage. This is mathematics by grade level instead of by school. Again, the, out, the outlier out there is the high school. Uh, grade four, I believe, is that right? You can see the numbers there. This is ELA again by grade level. You can see grade four there is slightly below the others, but he's slightly below the state and somewhat below our other grade level. This is sort of an interesting plot too, again broken up into those six <coughs> squares. This, this, all of the gray ones um, represent different groups, districts, schools in the state. This is all grades in math. No, I'm sorry, in English language arts. And the, oops, I hit the wrong button. The, uh, the red dot there indicates where reading is compared to all other groups in the state. Bigger dots, bigger circles, bigger districts. Yeah, yeah larger, larger groups, larger groups, larger districts, larger groups. Yeah. Yep. Well, no, no, because all of the great ones represent the state. So the yeah, um, no, I don't think that there is. I mean, the average is fifty six. Does it say it on there? No, that's that is the average. Okay. Fifty is the average. Fifty 
PSG3 and 63. Yeah, so it looks like most of them are in that 50th range in the middle. There's some on either side. And running ball is right there. This is then the same thing with this for math. to see, I mean, certainly that's, that's available, we can look, but I don't think they identify the, the dons, if that's what you're asking. I mean, all of the district profiles are available on the DESC website, so we can look at district by district. So, just a little bit about the Massachusetts Accountability System. So, the state is measuring each school and district's progress toward reduce, reducing that proficiency gap in half. From 2010, the 2010-11 school year, to 2016-17. That the goal overall is within that time frame to have reduced that gap by at least half. Schools making sufficient progress toward narrowing the gaps are classified into level one. While the state's lowest performing schools are classified into levels four and five. In general then, the districts are classified into a level based on the level of their lowest performing school. Years chosen. And once we hit 2015 17, do we have a new set of gaps we have to close, or is this the federal government thing? I think that's part of the federal guidelines. So they asked for a few years ago, if you remember, um, we had a different designation. It was with AYP. Yeah. Right. So that actually is still the designation under the federal law, but the state asked for a waiver. And uh, instead of using the AYP designation, they now have changed. They, they got a waiver approved by the federal. Department of Education to go to this system. So the waiver, uh, I believe the waiver was approved in 2012-13. So that's how long like, the waiver lasts, then after that we're back to AYP or something? Well, I think 2016-17 was the year designated in the yeah. original oh, okay. legislation. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So this shows then um, level one, two, three, four. <laughs> level one means you're meeting. The gap. How, this is how schools are, are classified or designated. Level two, you're not meeting the gap, but you're making progress in narrowing that, in reaching that goal and narrowing that gap. Level three is not a specific cutoff, but as it says there, it's the lowest performing 20% of the schools from that other level. And then level four and five are the a more severely lower performing schools or districts. This, this is how the all the schools in the, in the in Reading Public Schools break down. So the high school is a level one school. As we know, Josh Wheaton this year was designated as level three, and the rest of the schools are level two. Kind of said this already, but level three essentially means you're not narrowing that gap um, quickly enough. So it's due to the overall lower MCAS scores and or particularly that one or more of those subgroups um, are among the lowest performing 20% in the state. At Joshua Eaton, there's a particular difference. We've seen it across the district um, in the slides that we've seen. But in Eaton, one of the, one of the indicators has been that high need subgroup are not achieving or making progress as well as their peers. <coughs> so, how does the state calculate this? They use sort of this formula um, that's called PPI, Progress and Performance Index. It combines information about narrowing these gaps as well as the growth. Ideally, they, they want you to have a PPI of 75 on a 0 to 100 scale. They're looking at both the annual index as well as the cumulative, which goes over the course of four years. There are seven core <coughs> indicators, which I'll look at in a second. 
um, that they have as part of their formula, they assign a particular rating to, as well as a couple of extra credit indicators. Um, we see them here. So the seven core indicators are all there to the left. Obviously, the first five could pertain to all schools, all levels. Six and seven would only pertain to high schools. And then they do give you what they call some extra credit indicators. Um, if you make a significant reduction in the number of students that are receiving warnings, or basically failing levels, or if you increase significantly the number of students that are um, achieving at the advanced level. Essentially what they, is this the next slide? Yeah, so you can look at Eaton's, this is on um, the state's website. Essentially what the state is doing then, if I can get this right without getting my cheat sheet out of my pocket, they're assigning um, a certain number of the performance index, I'm gonna look, for each content area, for each student. And so basically, I wanna look, I wanna make sure I get this right. So for each area, if for each student that is achieving proficient or advanced, you're awarded 100 points for that particular student. It's 75 if a student is receiving in the higher portion of the needs improvement range, 50 points for each student um, achieving in the lower portion of needs improvement, 25 points for warning or failing, um, in the higher part of warning or failing, and zero for the lower part. So they do that in each content area for each student. Essentially then, they take the total number of points divided by the number of students, and it gives, you, gives the composite, um, or the, the, the index for that year. Um, and then they want to determine how much growth or progress is made from one year to another. Um, and that was based on, we go back to these indicators, that was it. They take each one of those indicators, See if any of the extra credit indicators apply. And they award, you can see there, there's various things that they'll award. So if you are on target, they give you 75 in bold. If you're above your target, you get 100. If you improved, but you're still below target, you get 50. If there's no change, you're pretty much constant, you're getting 25. And if you've actually declined instead of making progress, in narrowing that gap, they give you zero. So as you can see in this, and this is, as I said, available on the state website for each and every school. This is an example of Eaton's. So you see here the four columns, 2011, 12, 13, 14, how those points were awarded each year based on the growth from the previous year. Um, right button here, total them up. You can see the cumulative PPI is they take four years ago and it's multiplied by one, 2012 multiplied by two, 2013 multiplied by three, 2014 multiplied by four, all divided by 10, it gives you that figure. There'll be a test on that formula. <laughs> extra credit if you have, you make significant progress in reducing the number of students that are receiving warnings, or you make significant progress in students getting advanced. So, um, let's see, there were, yeah, so it says here, so this one, for instance, you can see extra credit for increasing the percentage of advanced. Okay, so it, so it breaks it up by each subject area. Yes? Is this formula going to be similar to the part be, I think it's going to be similar. It's going to be similar. They yeah. said that the group yeah, it's a, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I just, I mean, they put more weight on the last each last year. How yep. can we possibly get out of this in a year? 
here. Again, I'm assuming they do that because the goal. Yeah. Well, again, you can make significant progress that, that year, and so you may not hit the target, but again, you're going up into that level two range because you're making significant progress even though you're short of the target. I'm assuming, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, that each year is weighted more because that target year was 2016, 2017. Right. And that was by oh, the original legislation. Ne next year, the, the scores are not, we're held harmless next year because of the fire. So we are going to get No, no, that, no, 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 the advantage, no, we're still getting the scores. So we're not going to, but the reason why I'm saying that, we're called harmless, but the scores, we are still going to get the information, which is going to be important for us as we continually try to improve. So if we're held harmless, can, are we stagnant? No, what it means is you can only go up. You can only go up. You can't go down. Yeah. Mr. Martin? Yes. I love the fact that you're sending questions as you go, and I want to encourage that. Just so that the reporter uh, who's here from the from the paper, Chronicle, forgive me. Uh, could you state your name? And then give your question, just so that if it's a really good question, he wants to quote it, and he'll know who the source is. Thank you very much. Continue, Mr. Martin. Thank yep. you. Each year, the state releases what they call the report cards, both on the overall school district as well as each individual school. I believe it was just last week everyone received emails or information that this is now available on the websites. Um, essentially, what the, this is a snapshot of the district overview. Um, if you click on that link to receive them in your email or you go to the school website or the state website for that matter, um, it breaks down a bunch of information on each district and each school. Question? Yeah. I mean, Annie, I, we don't know what email you're talking about. So did, us don't did, people, we did, did people not receive emails yet? Okay, so, no. so maybe they didn't all go out yet, but they're in the process of going out, the report cards? I've seen it on other schools' websites, but okay. Josh, you have you gotten up to it? Okay, so I thought through central office we've been sending, sending those out. Was it through was it through Edline or was it through? Uh, they're all all the links are available on on the school websites right now. So when I can we can point those out to you and we'll check on the emails. Yes, did anybody receive the emails? Yeah. Nobody yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, You know, this is just a screenshot of that. I mean, it wasn't intended to try to cut anything no, off. No, I don't Basically, mean to just, explain, like, what that means. Yeah. What Basically, the, the state gives assistance to any school district or school that's in level three. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, John, did you want to add anything about that? Or no, we're going to get to it. Word. I think it was right. Are you talking yeah, about level three. the assistance levels? I'm trying to see where you're reading. Yeah. So it breaks down much of what we've gone over with in some of the other slides, how the district is doing overall in each content area compared to the state, how we're doing in terms of growth overall, other things. Was there a question? Um, I did have a question. Yep. Rebecca Lieberman. Um, this is all grades combined? This is, this is the district report card, so it's all, all grades, all schools. Okay, so each school kind of also. I'm sorry, say that again? It kind of masks the, uh, what, uh, what happens when you implement the new standards, which is when the 2013-14 scores in math started to drop. That, it masks, because, it's, because, because it includes all grades. School, which is pretty yep. common for Clearly there are some grades that have been impacted more in the transition, but that's what you mean that yes. overall. And yep. this sort of hides that. You have individual grades. Are you talking about math in particular? Yeah. 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 Yes, I mean, I don't know if I would say math. I mean, overall, you know, we could talk a little bit more about that as we get to some of the other trends that we're seeing. 
but I mean, ultimately our goal is we want students to hit mastery at particular levels. You know, oftentimes people will think, uh, well, if there's a dip at a particular grade level, well, it's just it's fourth grade, well, or it's just third grade, but truly that's an accumulation of several years of learning and, and growth. You know, there are tests in kindergarten, first and second grade, but clearly those are very important years in mastering concepts so that when you start being assessed in third and fourth and so forth, you have those understandings. Yes, I'm sorry. I am a little concerned, like um, somebody said here about those, um, just showing the overall picture for the district, because there's a big concern to the jump from 40% um, of the kids leaving eighth grade for the past two years. So 37, 40%, I don't know the exact numbers. We're in the needs improvement and warning category. You're sending 40% of the kids out of eighth grade into high school without adequate math skills. And it's, I feel like it's just being brushed over. So, well, I have some more slides we'll look at. I'm not sure I agree completely with that assessment, but we'll take a look at some more, then we can talk more about it. Yes, sir. John Coyne, I have another question to kind of follow up on that. How are the kids catching up so quickly in high school, as opposed to what are they doing right in high school that we're not seeing uh, let me get through the report card, then we're going to show you some more slides and sort of how this goes. And if I don't get to it, remind me and we'll talk about that. <laughs> the report card also shows things about high needs population, percentages, enrollment, <coughs> teachers, average class size, so forth. Oh, excuse me, pardon me. Um, attendance rates, discipline referrals, high school graduation rates. So let's start talking about the, this was something that was, that was brought up, this transition. So this is a screenshot from the state website about the MCAS. And this, this is for mathematics. And you'll see there's a little bit, they did math a little bit differently than ELA. So basically, in 2011, a new curriculum framework was adopted by the state with some significant differences. They've made some changes in the past, in, in my view, these were more significant. The last standards were from about a decade ago. 2000, they were updated in 2004. And as you can see, for the last three years, the state assessment has changed each year in math, not necessarily in ELA. So you'll see that um, in this year, 2011 and 12, that there is still a focus primarily on the old um, framework and focusing mostly on the standards that did connect to the 2011 framework. The next year, 2012-13, they put a focus on the new, stand new standards, but at this time, the ones that connected still to the old framework. And then last year, 2013-14, the first time that the 2011 math framework was the focus, was the focus of the complete assessment. Not saying that's either good or bad, that's just the way the state has rolled it out. Yes? Okay, so that's the 2013, a couple slides before, we went from a 66 to a 60 to a 45 to a 20. We went from 60 to 45, we didn't. Yeah, in, in, particular, in particular grade levels, yeah. I mean, and that was an overall. Yeah, yeah. No, it like wasn't looked at to say, because I mean, I don't remember seeing that to say, how come we went from 60 to 45? Well, that was too. Oh, this year you're talking about. Yeah, that's where we, this is where we started to see a fairly significant it was larger in this year. But the difficulty is that also the assessment was changing each year. I mean, that's I'm not that's not excusing. I'm not trying. But I'm just saying that's an important variable that's in that mix. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, yes. Mike can speak. What she's trying to say. If you go back to the slide, the John can give you ideas. Like. Yep. She's saying that there was a remarkable drop from 11 to 12 to 13, and then even more remarkable from 14 to 15. But we didn't have these had bell alarms going off last year that we have going off this year. And so why were those early warning indicators ignored is the question. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right, Mark? Yeah. 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 So that's the question. Why were the early warning indicators ignored, and what has, yeah. what has happened over the last year? to compensate for that drop. 
Okay, so let's I'll get to that. I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring it up now, but I'm excited to see them this week. That's not, yeah. let's, let's take a look at the ELA. I mean, essentially, in the 2012 13 year, um, the MCAS started focusing on the new standards. So we're, we are now in the, this was the second year. We're going into the third year of the new framework being assessed. So that was the first year? 2013? Yep. So 2011 12, they were still assessing. That was the year, first year that the new framework was adopted, but we were still assessing the old framework. And then 2012 we 13. Yeah, um, ELA, I think we saw some. But that most of that is re being recovered now, in the second in the second year. Do it, yeah. I mean, one of the things, and again, this is I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let's use math as an example. When we're when we had a framework for an entire decade, the math teachers will tell you. I was a secondary principal. They will tell you we had every single released question from the state for the last 12 years. We knew exactly what the, those assessments, the types of skills, how the, what standards were being focused on more than others. And so it's a transition when we're making the switch. Again, I, I don't mean to put that out as to minimize anything, but it's simply one of the variables, one of the realities of the situation. Yes? Um, Steve Zephyr, so can I ask a question then? If the change or some of the drop that we're noticing is because of this change, aren't all the other school districts having to do the same thing? And yep. so what's different about what's happened in Reading versus why some of the, a number of the other school districts have made the pace. Yep. So I want to talk about that. I have some thoughts and we can, we can discuss that. First, let me look over real quickly. We've talked about this before. I know the schools have talked about it as well. Some of the major shifts in the standards. In literacy, as, you, as you've heard, there's a big shift on evidence from text. Literacy across the curriculum areas. Uh, being able to read uh, well and understand the content areas. In math, there's been a huge shift that the conceptual understanding, a deep conceptual understanding is, is paramount so that students are able to extend or apply that knowledge in what is many times novel situations. So I want to start looking at some of the, this, start to get a little bit more complicated, but I, I found these interesting. So this shows the ELA scores in grades 4, 8, and 10, because I think there's some key years in some of the difficulty in some of the standards. The reason we have some arrows, the reason we have some arrows here because it shows when new frameworks were coming into play. Going all the way back to when MCAS started in 1998. So the blue line is grade four. You can see that it made a rapid increase for several years. Down a bit, which seemed to coincide a bit with the 2004 shift. And kind of up and down over a year or two, um, still sort of remaining in there. Now we're starting to see a bit of a drop there. The, the red is grade eight. And the green is high school. Even more drastic are the math scores over the years. Again, going back to when MCAS began in 1998. This really stood out to me that a huge drop in the fourth grade scores after the last shift in the standards. Yep. Right here at the end, yes. Well, after, after this one, right. Not quite as drastic as, but certainly, yes, a downward trend in all three. Yeah. As we're trying to make that adjustment, that correction. A couple of slides to try to capture this, depending on how you want to view it. We want to try to capture the ELA and math differential compared to the state average. Some people see it this way. I kind of see it in the next in the next slide. The red is the ELA, blue is the math. They're basically showing how many points above the state average. If this, the state average is here, where are we? Again, there's the downward trend. More drastic here in math. 
after, after the business operates. Yeah. So if this was, these are yeah, the new standards steady, coming in? Steady decline in the LA. There's one option. Part of this, remember, because it's compared to the, to the state. Um, this, yeah. Or you could say the state was starting to adjust because maybe the state averages are really low. I don't have that slide. This slide might show it a little bit. This year I just take out math. If the baseline in red represents the state average, this is all grays. What's happening in the last several years? How many points we were above the state average? One of the things that we wanted to look at, because it was brought up, brought up, and somebody, somebody's here, but we were at the Joshua Eaton um, PTO, I guess it was considered a PTO meeting. Someone talked about funding or the resources that are being given to the schools. Maybe you asked, I forget, you asked the question. And I thought, so we wanted to try to give some picture of that. It is complicated, I think, because I would, I'd be the last to say that there's a direct causal relationship, especially as you look at all the districts in the state. I do think that, uh, oh, actually, I want to say one more thing, though, about that, too. Certainly third and fourth grade, I want to look because somebody had emailed specifically about that over the weekend, so knowing that there would be a crowd here from even about third and fourth grade. This is just last week? No, this is, this is third and fourth grade across the district, but this is just how our district has compared to the state numbers of proficient or advanced in just those grades through the years. As you can see in this, if you just look at fourth grade math, for instance, that's the concern right there. So then getting back to the funding issue. One of the things that, that has been happening, so we were taking a look at, and I have a couple more slides to try to put it in context. This has been brought up a few times in a few of the public meetings. I know it was included in last year's um, budget book. Um, <coughs> this is Reading's per pupil expenditure, the state ranking. So there's 326 districts in the state. Um, public record, the ranking of each state in terms of the per pupil expenditure for education. Um, we've always been sort of, you know, we've often said, oh, we can have the state average. Um, but we've always prided ourselves. I know I've lived in Reading for 20 years, I've been an educator in Reading for 18 years now, I think. We've always prided ourselves that given, you know, even below average, but we've been able to get very high results. We've been very proud of that. Um, and I think we work very hard at that. I think we've been very transparent in the budgets about how we do that. One of the things that has been happening though since about 2005, 2006, we sort of reached a peak in our state uh, ranking. And the, the current uh, data that's released is 2012. We don't yet have the 2013 data. But you can see now in 2012, according to the state release documents, that Reading's rank was 304 out of 326 districts. I would say, and I'll, let me try to put it in context, and I'll take some questions about, about that. So we thought to kind of, <coughs> We ourselves want to take a look at that in context because we didn't know, you know, we don't want to say that that's just a direct cause and effect there. Um, so I wanted to look at a couple of things with comparable communities. So this slide, for instance, captures comparable communities that are right around the same ranking. So here's Reading's rank at 304. So it shows the districts that are in that vicinity and what their overall scores are in all grades, ELA, math, or science. I won't go through long, but I'll let kind of take a look at that. When I looked at that data, nothing sort of, I mean, there were some things that we saw a little bit above, a little bit below, but nothing that really stuck out as a huge outlier in that. I wanted to look, look this weekend, then we want to take a look at surrounding or comparable communities. So in the last few years in the, in the district budget book, I know Ms. Delay has always, and always included comparable districts by <coughs> demographics and so forth. So we pulled every single one of those districts that have been used for the budget book. 
as well as, and then that's why we've got a little bit smaller font here, I wanted to add every single surrounding or contiguous community, which I think she tended not to use in the budget book, to look at where are all those communities, both in terms of state rank in per pupil, and also the scores to see where they're outliers in terms of communities that were similar in their rank, if there are communities that were significantly outscoring, where were they in comparison in the rank? where there are huge shifts to be made in curriculum, um, in shifting over to new programs, that I think it impacts districts like ours that do not have layers of positions, that when I talk to some of these districts, when it comes to curriculum coordinators, um, instructional coaches, there were years, if I went back to the other slide, where some of those positions did exist in the district, as that has dropped some, they, we don't have those positions. I think we've taking great pride in doing very well with that. I, I don't think it's something necessarily that our district is able to sustain long term. My personal view is that in those years when we're making a, a big shift, it impacts us more greatly than it does in other years. Um, some of the times, you know, we take very strategic steps knowing that major shifts like that could take us a bit longer than other districts to make. Um, and sometimes that's why we begin that process a little bit earlier. Um, in some ways, I think we can be a little bit ahead of the game in, in trying to shift to the new standards. Again, that's my own view. I do think it plays out differently in those years. And I think the shift in these particular standards, and especially in math, is a major one. That, um, I'm not saying that's all of it, but I do think that it's, it's playing out a bit in that. Yes, sir. I I, so following up with that sort of question, um, when there were these changes made in the curriculum, yeah. are you saying that pretty much there were no additional resources put in place to assist no. with that? No, absolutely there were additional resources. Um, brand new programs purchased, new resources, new materials, um, significant professional development. But it's a little bit different um, in some communities where you have a person who's coordinating each particular subject level, sometimes by or some are content areas sometimes by grade level. 
um, that it's actually working in the classrooms with the teachers to make that shift a little more swiftly. Um, and I'll talk about at the end some of the things that we have done and that we're going to continue to do that we're increasing to do that. Um, I mean, is that a lesson learned? Is that something we should have done? Is that something we Which should part? do? Those types of things. Well, we're thinking about looking at getting a new science curriculum. Is that a budget? Too. Are we going to put person in position to facilitate that? Yeah. I think, I mean, that's, that's a budget. Question. We make we make choices. I mean, we'll look at some of the some of the issues that we that we are faced with, choices that we make. Let me let me finish up because we're at the end and then we can have more discussion, take some questions. So the identified issues or concerns, and most of these I think I have touched upon, but a couple more I want to mention. Clearly, we talked about the gap between the high need students and the non high need students. If I had to pick the number one, and there's a reason we put that on top, I think if there is a single indicator that's causing the level three, that's, that's a major one, a major one. Without that difference, you know, we would still be having the discussion about some drops and needing to adjust and make that shift. I'm not sure we'd be doing it in the level three context. Right. Yeah. Just to say, it's actually, they actually closed the gap between the high and the performance. It actually went up slightly, not enough to make a difference. But the real driver in Joshua Eaton is was the population. It's both. Design. It's both. And also, I think you know you could you could pull out things because I think it was close. You, you know, we, we have a huge focus on the shift in math. You could look at science and say, well, that's a huge area that we haven't been able to address in the last several years across the board, elementary, middle, high school. Um, so I, I think it's both, which is why I say you know gap of some of our subgroups compared to the aggregate. Um, some of these I've already talked about. Implementation of the, the new, last year was the first year of the math and focus program. Being sure that that is being implemented with fidelity, giving the <coughs> teachers the support that they need for that. <coughs> Literacy, writing, and the content areas. When we look at the data, and I know some of you that were at the meeting at Joshua Eaton, and some of the, when we look at the question by question data, um, it just kind of jumps out at you when you see students, when you see figures like, 90 some percent of the students left a particular question blank or you know received you know and that tends to be the short answer or the open response often that's a, that's an issue of the literacy the literacy component are they being presented in something in a, in a different way and they decide they just kind of look at it or struggle with it for a moment and don't know what to do with that um, other times it's other areas it also um, has to do with with other issues, it could be, um, you know, that, that's where things like the connection of the students, the social emotional, these tests are sort of, I always say they're sort of endurance tests as well. If a student <laughs> struggles or has needs, they're doing their best at it, they get through a question like that and they just say, I'm just gonna skip that. So that's where the high needs population could have uh, even more of an issue with those. That's definitely an area we need to look at. Talked about the outdated science curriculum materials and resources. That's been overdue for a while. There's no question that's a major, just in terms of the resources, the curriculum materials that we'll need to do is a fairly large budget issue without even talking about the positions that may or may not be helpful to implement that. Um, we talked about the other night when we were at Joshua Eaton, the need to improve the communication with the families about the curriculum change, the instructional methods, what's happening exactly unit by unit. Teacher collaboration time. We have you know, wonderful educators in Reading. The time that they have to collaborate are especially helpful when uh, we make shifts like this in the program. Talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We're even seeing that keyboarding skills are becoming more and more important and do we need to you know, set out a scope and sequence for making sure that students are getting those skills by the time they reach a certain grade level. In what grade level? Can you be, can you be I think this is I think this is playing out, especially you know, we might that's something that we're eager to see this year when this, as the state is, is transitioning to online testing to see how that yeah, plays out. Yeah. And it's all online. How old are these little kids who are taking the part on a computer? Third or fourth. Grade? I mean it starts with third grade. So you're gonna be part teaching them keyboard. Well, I think it plays out differently in different grades. Yeah, I know, but even, even more. Even, even well. I mean, the composition tests are a little bit higher. I, I, 
Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble keeping up. So if, if we can raise our hand before we talk, that would be really helpful. Thank you. We've been talking in our district about these last two sort of combined, the classroom space and juggling the early childhood, full day kindergarten demands and needs and the impact that's having in some areas in class size, teacher planning time, the programs, the impact on some of the other programs, art and music and so forth. I wanted to pull these out too because we, in addition to those larger topics, this is sort of by standard. We wanted to look at, in each one of the content areas, if we felt that there were particular areas of the assessment, whether it's a type of question or a standard, um, that 75% or less of the students, um, you know, or 75% or more, that's right, fewer than 75% are showing good, sound, and efficient um, achievement levels. I like doing it by grade level like this, it really shows up. You know, absolutely the open response across the board in mathematics, if it's presented in that way, it seems to be throwing a lot of kids, especially our high needs kids. The geometry strand is something that we're looking very closely at. Those two things really stick out. Fractions in the elementary level. ELA, again, open response across the board. I think the open response as we went by you know, student by student really does tend to difference or break up between high needs and the non high needs students in many cases. And science, I think, across the board. Five, eight, nine school. I need for some new materials. Some of the things that we have already begun, um, I think some announcements went out that it, we're going to be sending out here. So we're working with the DESE um, and their assistance team. They have a district-wide and school-by-school school assessment tool. So I actually think we're very impressed with this. It's very comprehensive. It not only covers, uh, for instance, the specific um, content areas or issues by the assessment, but all areas of the school. You know, Parent-teacher communication and and anything that impacts the, love, um, the community of the school. My own view is that is the way to address these issues. It would be great, um, not great, but I don't mean that, but it would be a lot easier if we could just say, oh, here's the standard. We need to pump up this particular standard in this grade level. I don't think it's that simple. I think it's normally a lot of different variables coming together, especially when you're talking about Things like communication and the shifts and transition and the high needs versus it's not that simple. One particular grade level isn't, as I said, isn't just about that particular grade level. We're also, by the way, moving from a, you know, the shift in standards now and the new program is really about mastery. For instance, we had a program that was really a spiral effect that would keep coming back to certain topics or concepts so that the student at a particular time would get mastery of that which in some ways makes sense that in some standards we may not see mastery right away in third grade or in fourth grade, but eventually you'd see, you know, somebody had asked, well, as the grades go up, they seem to be getting it by the time the student reaches high school. Now it really is about mastery. Can you explain why I don't see special ed on here at all? I mean, why isn't that almost like number one? So special oh. education for, I mean, if that was on the recommendation that we get some So I'm going to get to that when we, when we talk about uh, MTS and the inter... Why are these in any order of priority? Or? No, I mean, I put the first one first because I thought that you know, that's the easiest thing to talk about. Um, I mean, you can talk about the first one first because I thought that because it had to do um, you know, with, with the steps that we're taking with the, with the state and that will come out of that assessment. But I also want to talk about the interventions that we're, that we're putting in place. As you go through those. We're looking at making sure that all students, we're looking at how students are being placed. And certainly as we get into middle school, we had discussions about things like our placements and sequences, making sure that all students at any grade level, from kindergarten on, are given opportunities to see these types of, 
take math as an example, these types of problems, these types of opportunities to apply their knowledge in a different way so that they're accustomed to that, that it's not something that's, that's new, that it's seen as an integral and natural part of learning math. We're looking at things like increasing academic-based average school activities, especially at the elementary level. That's been very successful at the other levels. Increasing the professional development support for the new curricular programs. We're doing that, and we have some coaches, some coaching that's scheduled to come in. Um, one of the key things that we've done this year, and it, it may not sound like it's quite as important, but I actually think it's going to make a significant change. Um, P up this one, whoops, hit the wrong button. Establishing a district wide PLC, and PLC, sort of a, a phrase that's become well known in, in education, professional learning community. But basically, it's a chance for the teachers that are teaching the same content area, same grade level, to collaborate in a way where they are always looking to see how are the students doing? Are they making the progress that's expected from classroom in whatever classroom, whatever school? It's an opportunity for the teachers to come together from across schools. That's one of the things that we did touch upon briefly at Eaton, that we would not want to see an outlier in a particular grade or particular school. I think that's more likely to happen when we shift in a, you know, from, a, from, a, from an assessment, from a, from a curriculum framework that we've been very familiar with. I compare it to the, you're in a different terrain. Your compass points don't quite work. You need each other's collaboration. We need to see what classroom, what school was having uh, success with that. And can get your bearings, compare that. Our teachers have already begun working in that way. I actually think it's going to make a big difference, um, especially at the elementary level where we have five different schools. Yep. I, well, these sound great. I love the idea of the teachers working together and talking to them and being able to get those best practices to all the schools. What we are hearing is that these are happening by there being substitutes in the class. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. On a regular basis. Like bringing substitutes. Not that. I don't, I'm not sure. Well, the PLCs that I'm talking about, it has not, that's happening during the professional time that teachers have. Um, that's happening. So some are during Wednesdays, some are after school times that we designated as that. I've always said No, this structure has not been in place like that. I ask that you go back and clarify within the schools when. I think you're talking, about, you're talking about the data teams. You're talking about the school-specific data team. Right? Yeah, you're not, Which this, is, is, not this is something different. Yeah. Okay. And again, I mean, my point about that, whether it's working or not working, I, my own view is that's not as complete because you're just looking at your own data. That to be looking at that data, we really want that to be district-wide. You know, in other words, you wouldn't want it to be just one fifth grade, one, one building, but what's the data look like across the district? A particular grade level, much more informative, much more useful. That's part of the down here I have here um, using MCAS and DDM. The state um, uses DDM to be district determined measures. For instance, if we have common assessments in place, if everyone's teaching the same program, well, how do the results look like for each one of those common assessments? Uh, the teachers need that opportunity to compare those results to see which students are still struggling. Um, what strategies work best? What do I need to go back and, and, and intervene, you know, have an intervention before moving on? Um, for implementing, you know, someone had brought up special education. MTS is, SS is not just special education, but it's making sure that regardless of the student being in special education or regular education, that they're getting the interventions that they need, not only for academic supports, but also for social, emotional, behavioral supports to make sure that students are continually making progress. Uh, we've had other presentations about that. I know some of the individual schools have given presentations on that as well. We are also looking at, as we are now getting whole new amounts of data, many districts have a data analyst position um, that has become very useful to them. Uh, we're actually in process through the grant received, we received of putting this in place. Some of the additional resources that we're looking at long term, and again, it, sometimes it comes to some of the choices um, in terms of the, the, the funding or resources that we have available. I already mentioned the other positions, instructional coaches. 
I think if we pulled teachers and if we said what's one of the very useful positions that we've had in the past that we don't have now would be instructional coaches, specialists in mathematics and literacy. The ability to continue to attract and retain high quality teachers. I do think that that has played into it in the last few years in ways I've been in Reading a long time. Um, as a principal, I spent a lot of years hiring teachers as well. I was accustomed to teachers that were interviewing several places. They waited for us to make the decision. I do think, to be very honest, to be very candid, the last few years has been more difficult in competing with some other districts in terms of making sure that somebody wants to come here. Um, and a lot of that just has to do, I think we're in the right track now of correcting that. Um, upgrading science and engineering curriculum materials. New standards are just about to be introduced. Teachers are beginning to look at all that, and we're going to have some decisions to make about curriculum materials, resources, and updating the entire science curriculum. I saw a hand. Yeah. Can I ask you just to expand on something? Sure. Um, the instructional specialist, what I'm struggling with is, you know, like my son's in the 10th grade now, but, you know, they've changed the, to common for me. showed us a graph that showed the progress since MCAS started that the st our state has made in narrowing that gap, especially with the high needs group. Still a long way to go, but we've had significant progress in the last decade, decade and a half. Okay. And keep in mind that we're pretty much outscoring anyone else in the country. But then later we see that even still in this state, that a third of the students that are leaving Massachusetts schools to go to college are in need of remedial help in math or literacy. And that's particularly in the high needs group. Um, which is why I believe that the state is sort of leading and saying we still have to do some work in that area. And I believe that's why they shifted the, the standards. Yes?
that are not always getting some of that core instruction? <coughs> and does the expectation or ceiling get lower? Is something that's adequately addressed or applied here? I mean, it just really seems once again it's just a security <coughs> issue with everything else. And not being particularly Is there something in particular that's that get technical support and have to actually look at our program for that? I don't see that listed here. I don't see the emphasis being on the gap. This seems to be incredibly yeah. large. Yeah. I mean, maybe one of the things that I could have put on there is to make sure that our the special education and regular education are working very closely together. I don't, was there something in particular, for instance, that you were expecting to see? Yeah, I would, yes, I would see a bullet point that we are actually going to get some technical support and taking a look at how we do special ed within our school system and see if it needs to be revamped, looking at what's, you know, um, best, best practices and whatnot. There seems to be a huge gap. It is not actually, I don't think it's being addressed or even highlighted here. If I, can, if I can speak to that. I'm sorry, if I can speak to that. Um, the, um, the director is not here. I think she would be saying it. We've actually started having these conversations. We are going to bring in a consultant. Uh, we're in the process of getting a consultant to bring in to take a look at all of our special education programs to tell us what's working and what's not working. This is a, this is a good. If I can, and even in the survey or in the analysis, the assessment. That if I. Let me, if I could say two points. So we're going to we're bringing in a consultant to take a look at our special education programs. This is a good time to do it. We have a new director on board now um, to take a look at what's working and what's not working. Okay? So I think that's what you're asking. We are actually in the process of getting a consultant to take a look at our programs. The second thing I want to bring up, which I think you were just alluding to, is the survey is going out this week. First, we're gonna send it out to Joshua Eaton School because uh, of the level three status, but eventually we're gonna be sending out this survey um, in about a week to the rest of the district. The survey is a very comprehensive survey. I got the link today um, from the, the DSAC. It's 131 questions spread out over 10 different key areas of school effectiveness. So parents are gonna get it, teachers are gonna get it, community members are going to get. Um, and they're going to have an opportunity to give us the feedback that we need on how to improve our entire school district. So the, those are two key pieces of data that, that will help us. <coughs> Mr. Martins, if I might, it, it, uh, the way I see it from the screen, it looks like we have two slides and questions. Could we, could we hold on the questions and let him finish? I, I, again, everyone's going to have an opportunity. But again, if, if it's a question pertinent on that slide, yeah, I can back up the okay. slide from those questions. So I just wanted to end. I mean, we're posting this on all of the websites with the live links. If you have not received the email yet, or if you want to look at either the overall district or the in, your individual schools um, report card, we have the links here. The live links will be posted online. Yes. So thank you, Mr. That was excellent. Um, we're going to do this and we're going to do this with um, control. Okay? So if you have questions for Mr. Martins, I'd love to, for you to raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you. You can say your name and ask a question. I'd rather hold comments and suggestions and all of that until a, a different point. I do want people to be able to ask specific questions if they have them. I also want the committee to be able to ask questions because I know that Mr. Martins was speaking directly to you this evening, and I, I, uh, I, I, I won't use the words correctly, but I don't mind that at all. His presentation was actually to the school committee, believe it or not, at our meeting. So I do want to make sure that the school committee can ask questions at the same time. Okay? So we're not going to talk over each other. We're going to show a lot of respect, and we're going to ask our questions. Sound good? Thank you. Demetra, up front. Uh, Demetra Sagris. Uh, okay, I have three. Would you like one, two, or all three? I, I didn't go that detailed into the rules. Uh, <laughs> I want to know. Please start, and if it gets too long, we'll Okay, so the first us. question on the slide, second to last, it says increased instructional time. Can you please uh, explain how, in seven hours and 15 minutes that you have kids, I think that's the right amount of time, with 15 minutes of recess, which is not enough, I would argue, how are you going to increase instructional time? What are you going to take away? Art, music, what? 
or are you elongating the day? I don't have a good answer for that. At each le it looks different at each level. At each level, we're looking at the school day to see how can the schedule be done differently. This is a longer term issue. Ultimately, if we were able to extend the school day, that would help a little bit. Um, we're also looking at how do we increase instructional time in math and literacy by making sure that those content areas are shared, especially when we take the literacy, for example. Those particular literacy standards apply not just to ELA, but the standards clearly say science, social studies. How do we make sure that those are being addressed across the board? Um, so it looks different at each level. Um, I know each of the levels are exploring ways now to look at the schedule in different ways. Um, I don't know, John, if you had anything you wanted to add. To no, that. I just want to emphasize that what's on this slide is not happening tomorrow. These yeah. are things that require additional funding. And I, that was the purpose of this slide, is that these are the things that we feel we need to do, but require additional funding. I want to make a comment. Uh, I think the first part of the presentation is very good. You identified the sense of urgency. What really bothers me, and this is both to John and, and I mean the school committee, on these two slides, there's not one concrete point. There's not one budget statement. There's not one schedule. I mean, this is just so fuzzed out. I mean, if I sat, I mean, I sit in a lot of meetings. If I look at that, and I, say, I would say, we don't have a plan. We don't have anything concrete. And I mean, I'm not blaming anybody, but it's a little scary, and that bothers me. That's all I want to say. I'll, I'll comment on that, Mr. Lieberman, and then Dr. Dorian. And, and, and okay, so there's one. Implement all this reform to fidelity. Now, I have a PhD. I have no clue what that means. I'm sorry, if you put that down, that's insulting, okay? So please don't do that. So, uh, Mr. Lieberman, to your first point, Yes. Uh, I don't think there, I don't think that there is a single answer to this problem. So I don't think I was expecting to see a bullet point up there that said, we fixed the problem by implementing F. I didn't expect to see that. I, I understand that a lot of, a lot of these don't feel as though they're hard, factual, like by this date we're going to see this. I understand that. I don't know if I was expecting to see that because I don't think that there is a one answer this particular problem, and I think that most people would agree with that. Dr. Doherty, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Okay. Uh, and, and at that point, I really apologize, but I know I you just want to add Oh, sorry, Mr. This particular slide, I will say, and whether some of the main clarification I understand, and I apologize if that's unclear, but I can say that every bullet point has either already begun to happen or is happening in the next but couple goals. of weeks. We've talked a lot about identifying students and identifying students that are struggling, areas of struggling. I, and I asked this question of Dr. Doherty and the school committee. Have you taken a look at identifying teachers that aren't living up to the, to the standard? Have you looked at administration and if they're falling short in any way, shape, or form? Specifically, obviously, I'm a Josh Wheaton parent, but specifically, have you talked to the school committee, have you talked to teachers to ask them what they feel is lacking within our school? Uh, for one example, and we, Dr. Doherty was kind enough to sit down with my husband and I and, and Miss Feeney, we discussed the fact that our students were at Joshua and were not being taught math on Wednesdays. Now, as of last week, they now are being taught Wednesday, math on Wednesdays. So for the past how many years, They've gotten 20% less math curriculum than every other student in their age group in the state. If you don't think that's going to be reflective in these scores, we're, we're, we're fooling ourselves. Another example is I have a third grader and a fourth grader, and I know the fifth grade is in the same position. As of right now, 10 weeks, what are we, 10 weeks into school, our children are still doing reviews of chapters one and two in 
ELA, and in math. You look at how many weeks it's taken them to do two chapters in both of those major subjects. How in God's name are they going to get through the coursework that they need to get through for that grade level curriculum? It, it's not possible time-wise. So these are specific issues that clearly some, somewhere it's being, someone's falling short, whether it's the teaching staff or it's the administration. And I'd like to know, have you guys sat down with either? And I talk to them. I have. All of them. Okay, I you. you I, have. Um, I am in the process, and I have, and I have, and I'm going to continue to do, do that. Do you see an issue? I mean, is there, is I there really, an issue? I really, this is not the forum to have that kind of discussion. What is the appropriate forum? Right. Could you explain that? It's, you, you really can't have, in, the, in a public meeting, personnel discussions. I, I, I would answer it. We're not talking I would answer it this way. We're just talking with the formula. So, um, we're not mentioning names, obviously we get that time. Uh, are we looking at all areas where we can improve? We absolutely are. Is it the school committee's responsibility to be speaking to teachers like that directly? It absolutely is not. It's the principal, it's the superintendent. The school committee is responsible for making sure Dr. George Doherty is doing his job, and we are doing that. Um, it's Dr. Doherty's <coughs> job to make sure principals are doing their jobs, and it's the principal's responsibility to make sure teachers are doing their jobs. If you have an issue, I, I strongly recommend that you talk to the principal of your school. And if, if you aren't getting the answers that you want, you should absolutely be taking that to Dr. Okay. Dory. Which and I have already I, met with right. several Josh Eaton parents. And I implore you to do that, because I don't live in the Joshua Eaton area. I know some of the teachers that work there, um, but I don't know the teachers well enough for, for me to have conversations like that, or for most people on the committee, and I don't think it's wise. Please talk to the principals, and if you're not satisfied, get on the phone with Dr. Doherty, and if you're not satisfied, then you can let me know. But who, who awesome. for instance, the, the no math on, on Wednesdays, whose responsibility, or whose decision was that? I mean, who, shouldn't that be somebody's responsibility to make sure that our children are being taught math five days a week? Absolutely, I, and again, I, it's not, uh, the school committee, we're not educators. I do not have an educational background. We don't have a degree except for Mr. Knight and others. Mrs. Doxer. 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 I don't have a <laughs> Wait, and Mr. Robinson and Mrs. Wright. I, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer, I'm not a teacher. Um, and I don't think you want me giving advice to how we should be teaching. Our responsibility is to make sure that Dr. Doherty has the resources to get the job done. Your original question, are we looking at teachers, administrators, anything we can do to correct the problem, we absolutely are, I assure you of that. Next question, please. Yes, ma'am. To follow up on Mary's point, how are we gonna reteach the kids all the stuff that they lost, in particular the fifth grade class, seems to really have really declined. 60% of the class is not proficient in math. Where is the tutoring coming in? Because I know all those kids aren't gonna get tutoring but none of those kids know what they're doing. So how are you gonna reteach them the fourth grade math that they lost in fifth grade? That's gonna be- And it needs to happen now. We can't keep on having these conversations and meetings. Could they I, need the tutoring now. Could I, could I uh, rephrase your question? Sure. So maybe we can work together on this one. What other assessments are we looking at besides MCAT? to back that statement up by saying, are the uh, fourth grade or fifth grade, I forget what you said, I apologize. Um, but what other assessments are we using to make sure that our, ch our kids aren't that far behind? And then if that doesn't answer the question. So the clearest thing, and there's a couple of answers, but the clearest thing if you're talking about the math is through the common assessments that are used in the program. That the teachers then are able to look at those, that assessment data, compare it with data across the district, and then put interventions in place that students do need to go back, that need a additional tutor help, that they need uh, additional services that we're able to provide them as we go along. Well, that we're not waiting for the next state that assessment, that. that we're getting that unified unit. Yes. When is that happening? So that's happening currently this year. I, so I know that there are now math yep. tutors or specialists in the class. Yep, so a few people have just been hired. Yeah. But are they going back to the stuff that the kids don't feel that they're, or, you know, that the 
school that the field that the kids are proficient on, or are those people, are they just supports in the classroom through the math that they're learning in the current year? Both. Both. So they're helping. I mean, sometimes there's instructional there's instructional strategies and methods for how you support the kids at different levels in the classroom in a heterogeneously mixed class, and having more support positions in there can make that um, even more efficient for a teacher and for the students. But you also sometimes have to identify the kids that are gonna benefit from some small group instruction, or in some cases, even perhaps one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so we're, we're doing both. Yeah. We're also making sure, I'm not even sure how I put that on the slide, but I think that had already been communicated, but just in, a, in for Eaton's um, situation that about 50% or more of our Title I funds will be used to provide those sorts of supports for the, the students that are identified that need that the most. I was talking um, uh, to leave. Um, today, I mean, for instance, with, with high need students, for instance, um, in many cases, as we look across the board, it's not just our district, but it's an education overall. Um, students benefit from making sure that they're exposed to the expectations that the general uh, environment, the general group is being exposed to, but yet they're given the supports they need, they're given the interventions they need. Oftentimes, the group that we're seeing and it just holds out in our data, that are showing the least amount of growth are sometimes the students that are getting more individualized or small group instruction. They're not getting the same access to the core instruction that some of the other students are getting. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. I know that it can seem almost counterintuitive to think, well, those kids are gonna make more growth, but what oftentimes tends to happen is you take a, a small group of students that are struggling, bring them together, and if you keep them together and that's it, sometimes that can actually inhibit their growth and understanding. And the important part is to find the balance of how do you give them the supports they need while also making sure that they're benefiting from the peers, the collaboration that happens from peers, and the overall expectations that comes from the main classroom um, instruction. Yes, yeah, way down in the way. Hi, Elena Conway.
the work that I did. It's certainly not acceptable for what I expect from my children. But I'm sorry, by cliff notes, you mean that cliff we, we you do the said, assessment. You, had, you knew every question. The teacher no, no, knew I, every question. Let me finish. No, no, no. You knew essentially every question that was going to be. The teachers knew what to prepare for. My last statement. I have been put off by the tone of these meetings, and I alluded to that earlier. Karen Feeney started her meeting with jokes. ABCs, TPEs, NCATs, ha ha ha, how can we all keep this straight? Our home values have been affected. Our children's education is at stake. There is nothing more important. And not once have I gotten a tone from anybody that's given a presentation that they acknowledge this is a big deal for us as parents and that they are taking it seriously. It's never once been stated. And that would go a long way. I, 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 thank you very much for your uh, I, for one, have been in these meetings for nine years. Uh, we are serious about this. Every single school committee meeting is a serious meeting. I, I think it's okay at points to bring some brevity into this. I don't think you should start that way. Okay. Karen started the meeting with a um, And our feelings have never been Again, okay, listen, thank you, sorry, I shouldn't have said this like that. Um, I think that the school committee, and I think that the administration at both the principal level and uh, the administrative level at the high school has taken this issue very seriously. Um, I, I too was waiting for uh, that acknowledgement, and I did hear it tonight. We are acknowledging that we have a problem. So if you were waiting for us to say that, I'll say it, we're acknowledging that we have a problem and we are working towards fixing it. I don't, we can start every meeting like that, but I do, I do, uh, I, I think we have said it. And if you didn't hear it, I, I apologize that you didn't hear it loud enough. So I was using my outside voice. And yeah, that's my idea of dealing with stress. I joke. Next question. Uh, Mrs. Lieberman? Yeah, I wanted to um, ask whether a proposed solution for the problem of last year's eighth grade scores, which I believe is a direct result of taking algebra away from middle schoolers. Um, they don't know the algebra concept. They're, that's now delayed to a ninth grade under the new sequence. We've um, been told that y'all are studying the issue. How about we go back to pre-algebra in seventh grade and algebra in eighth grade for the majority of students? It was working. They were coming prepared and a far fewer a far smaller percentage of, the, of students were coming out of eighth grade scoring below proficient than is happening now. This, uh, we, this we're told that they we're told that um, that the new curriculum is more rigorous. I don't know what that means. All I know is my son did not learn what he needed to know in school. We had to go to an outside program, and that's really sad. Thank you. Next question. I don't really even have a question. I just I wanted to, I just have a comment. Yeah. Could you add, yeah, when, this, when this survey comes out, when you do this survey, could you include that question about um, are you getting outside help from outside tutors or cumin or are still? That's an excellent point. Because I, I, there's a lot of people I speak to that have already hired tutors or they're sending their kids to special schools. And I feel like the results that we're getting to these tests you know, if we have 20% of the kids that are getting tutoring help outside of school, which I, I don't know what that number is, but I think it's significant enough that it's worth asking the question. Well, so, thank you. I was going to ask that question as well. It's my understanding that that survey is a state survey. Correct. Um, but we can look into seeing if we can either we add did. that or alter it. We'd have to send a separate survey. You can't, you can't alter it. I think it's an interesting question. But at all grade levels, you know, I think it's, I mean, I think parents are signing their kids up they're uncomfortable with the math, you know, so. Um, yes, talking about, going back to my question before. Can, can you question. state your name? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Neither do I. Stalled it. And then you keep 
talking about how the frameworks constantly change. And I, part of the reason I think we have is that the frameworks change and we had a new principal. And I don't know if they, she was getting guidance from, it was kind of like she was placed there and here, figure it out. And I, and I have a problem with that. If your frameworks constantly change, are you going to do that again? She, you know, just. But she should have been given guidance from like a we, senior principal or something. Well, she did know. actually. She had a mentor for three well, years. Well, there's something wrong there. She had a mentor for three years. And it was a veteran principal that was in the district. Oh, I, I would say, too, that the standards cost, I mean, it's been well, you a decade ago that they shifted. So yeah, they just made the last meeting you guys kept talking about how the framework has changed, the framework changed. So they had three different shifts over the course, course of time yeah. that the MCAS has occurred. The last one was in 2004. And then 2000, yeah. Well, that's so the last year was 2011, but that's the other one prior to that was 2000. Thank you. I'm going to take a quick break because if you know what I have not done, I haven't looked right or left for this evening. Is there, are there questions from the committee that I'm completely ignoring? I apologize. Mrs. Rowe. Okay. Um, the survey that will be going out to um, parents and community and teachers, that is anonymous, correct? I'm sorry? Yeah, the, I think, survey, I think, I know the survey is anonymous? Oh, yes, it's anonymous. It would be anonymous. I think I just wanted to clarify that for an earlier question. I'm personally deeply interested to hear what teachers in this district and I do think that that survey is going to provide teachers an opportunity to give honest feedback because it will be anonymous. I just wanted to clarify that. I think the data we get from that is going to be very valuable. Mrs. Rep? I guess I just wanted to uh, clarify the issue with the use of previous MCAS tests because I think it was implied that that was used as a cliff notes. And really what I heard is that what, what we do is look at that data and use that data and those questions to inform instructions and to try to understand what strands need to be focused on. So with the long history of MCAS data, you can, you can look at that and the teachers know that you know, certain fractions are going to be focused on or other number theories are going to be focused on and they use that. So I think that was the point that, uh, that I heard Mr. Martin making and that that's been my experience over the years that I've been in this district. On the committee, so it wasn't that we that we can use that as a way to sort of short circuit. I, I've been on this committee since 2003, with some breaks, so that's eight years. And so from the beginning with MCAS, one of the things that we really tried to do in this district was not use it to teach to the test. So not teaching to the test, whether it's MCAS or Park, I think is a priority because at the end of the day. Our students, our kids, I have four kids who came through Killam School, and they're, they're graduates, some of them are graduates of Running High now, and they've had a great opportunity to get a great education. It doesn't mean that I didn't sit right where you're sitting before I sat here, because I was fighting for what I thought was right and what I thought my kids needed. So I appreciate the fact that everybody's here and that you're getting involved, and we're hearing you, and we're going to do something about it. Together, we can fix this. But it doesn't mean that we haven't been doing things all along. Now maybe we didn't put the resources in to this two years ago. We have a resource problem in this community. Uh, we can talk about that. We are going to talk about that between now and April. But I completely understand. Because there is nothing that's more important to you right now than your kids' education. Because they only get to go to this grade once. You don't want them to do it over. I get that. Everyone on this committee gets that because we all have kids who have been in this district from kindergarten up through high school. So we definitely need to work together. We have administrators, teachers, we have processes. The role of the committee is to set the policy, specifically manage the superintendent. We collect feedback on the superintendent. We do performance review on the superintendent. We provide feedback on all of the administrators. So this is not something that we don't under, I, I, I'm emotional about it myself. I understand this. I remember when my kids were in third grade and there were 29 kids in the class. You remember? I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a different superintendent at the time, two superintendents ago, and we were told that it was that, that status quo, and that's the last thing you want to hear. So this is not status quo. Nothing here is status quo. This is an important problem. We need to put resources in place. We need to listen to what you have to say. And most of all, we need to focus on what we're doing in the classroom for the students, getting them the tutors. There's a lot of pieces to this. Maybe this is not as crisp as it could be. 
maybe uh, talk to him about just you know rigor and fidelity in a program is not necessarily something that was as crisp as it could be. But the bottom line is we're going to do it. So please make sure we take the time to you know answer the surveys. We're going to use that data and know that every person on this committee cares deeply about it. It bothers us. We our kids were there at one time or another. It was a different problem at different elementary schools. But this is something we have to work together and it disturbs us deeply. I'm not going to say as deeply as it disturbs you because when it's your kid, there's something about it that just pulls at you a little bit more. But we, it's our responsibility <coughs> and it's our responsibility to make sure that the resources come to bear. So I appreciate everybody being here tonight. I know that every member of the committee is just as committed to it. Sir? I just have one more question. Let's go back to the math about not being taught on Wednesdays. Is that a is that a school wide? I mean, um, town wide policy or, or not? Or that's just the Joshua Eaton? That was that was not. A, it's not a town wide policy. So some of the other elementary schools are getting five days a week of math, and Joshua Eaton is getting four. Well, now now they're getting. Now they're getting. Now they're doing five. I should be noting uh, down and we should be bringing up at a meeting just to go over that report card, whether or not we think it's mm -hmm. successful in meeting the needs. Yeah, um, it would be there, a, long, a long discussion. Well, that's why it's not a discussion for this evening, but I do Absolutely. think it's, it's an action item that I'll take I away from this meeting. I understand that, but I think that's why you have so many parents now, like Molly and said, why weren't we getting, why weren't we alerted two years ago? Well, we've also gone into a new report card. Um, I know my daughter's in sixth grade right now, and she's never received so I think she was that first year where we took away grades. So I've never seen. So until she hit middle school and I actually got a number, I never knew what kind of student she was. Great, she was meeting the standards. And maybe by the end of the year, she'll be exceeding the standards. But really, I mean, how do you get that kid to reach to exceed that standard? They don't, they never see a concrete number. I can't go back to them and say, you only have a 75. What can we do to get you in the 90 range? You're meeting the standards. Okay. So again, I, I think it's an action item, but I, I know it's an action item. I'll take away from this meeting. Thank you. Sir, did you have a question? I did, yeah. My name is Gil Armstrong. My, uh, my concern is Josh Wheaton. Uh, I have a son in Parkland, so it's not all bad news. I'm delighted with how things are going in Parkland. Nobody seems to be going very well there. Um, I got in a couple of minutes late, so I might have missed a slide. There was a slide that I found clear and helpful on the state side that showed the four-year decline at our school, at Joshua Eaton, very clear decline. And meantime, the other schools in the district increasing their scores. And I, I want to ask a question. My wife attended the last meeting. We can take turns at these kind of things. She's at home struggling with the homework tonight with the kids. So last night she came home in the evening. 
said that there was not any good people there. Why wouldn't we be in? You know, we come home from in the 12 hour work day, face the children, face the homework. We're exhausted. They're tired. They're struggling. My kids are they're failing to be in class. Collins in touch with us with disaster. And so that's what we face in the evening. So why we come here, don't take it personal anyway. We're frustrated, and, and yeah, we're angry. Um, my question is, four years of a decline, how could we miss that? Now, there's a big crowd here tonight, but three or four years ago, my wife, I think, would be easy with regard to the NPS, down to Josh Newton, it's, I think, 14 to present. And there's a crisis. We've a crisis now after four years. And how come, how could along the way we miss this? Why, why did it take four years to get to where we are? Why was it missed? Yeah, I asked Donna, and I, I, I put the question to somebody to ask it at the last meeting. I'm still waiting for Nancy. Yeah. Thanks, and now it's the question. Thank you. Question, question, question more asked. It's the, it, uh, thank you, Mr. Knight. I can repeat what I say that I support the other people who spoke about the concerns of Josh Wheaton, about the concern about Homer. Thank you. I think he keeps saying thank you, but I didn't think any of the questions were answered. It was kind of like I said, at the other discussion meeting, I asked a question and it wasn't answered. Someone else asked a question, they just rephrased it a little bit, and it wasn't answered. You just keep saying thank you, well, thank you, and we go on our way. We don't answer the question. I don't have to say thank you, but I can go and I don't have an answer. I think it's an extremely valid that's question. That's condescending. I'm going to tell you right now, that was very condescending. So you definitely don't have my vote tonight. That's all that. You can laugh all you want. You can laugh all you want. Can somebody answer this question? Nobody's answering um, the question. Excuse me. I think it's an extremely important question that he's asking. The entire committee is asking the same question. I've We're asked it five times. The same question for the past time. But nobody's answering it. Who can answer it and when can we get an answer for it? I mean, four years of decline is not acceptable by any means. So who should answer it? I think Who's accountable to answer it? I will look at Dr. Yeah, no, I, I, will, I will attempt to answer it. Um, so we, you know, there's a couple things, and I think, I think Mr. Martin has alluded to this throughout his presentation. You have shifts that have been going on with the frameworks. So we did anticipate that there was going to be some decline. We knew that because we don't have, you know, as, as other districts do have, we don't have a lot of the different supports, the coaching supports, that, that will provide the guidance for teachers on the instructional piece especially. And that's the big shift in math. The big shift isn't the content. It's the instructional strategies that are changing. And that's the big shift. We've never seen that shift before in, in the frameworks. If you looked at the, the standards where we had the X's on the slide, that is not new. I mean, we've been teaching fractions. We've been teaching algebraic concepts. We've been teaching geometry. So it's not those things that have changed. It's the instructional strategies. And when you are making a shift in the framework like this, it's drastic as it was a shift. You need more supports. We didn't have those supports. So we knew there was going to be some decline. Now, to be honest with you, we knew there was a decline in Joshua. We did start trying to address this. Was it addressed as best as we could? No. And you know what? Ultimately, I take responsibility for that. Okay? I take responsibility for that. We did the best we could with the resources we had. Was it enough? It absolutely was not. So I take responsibility for that. But I want to tell you something else. Is that I absolutely have, we are doing everything we can. We were doing everything we can, and we're going to do even more. I mean, I, some of you know, I will meet with anyone. I will listen to your concerns. I've already met with six Joshua Eaton uh, parents, families to discuss the situation. I'm looking forward to the survey results myself 
because there are certainly things that I think are happening, and I think the results will say. And we are looking into who is doing it and who's not doing it. Um, I've been uncovering stories. I've been hearing some from parents. I've been hearing some from others. And I am. I'm, I was mortified when I heard that math was being taught on Wednesdays. I was mortified. Absolutely mortified how 20% of your instructional time is not being done for math. And as soon as I heard about that, math is now being taught on Wednesdays. Last week, when I was told. So, I welcome the feedback. I ultimately, yes, I take responsibility for it. And I apologize for that. Thank you. I also apologize for my sarcasm. I, you don't have to vote for me or not, but I do apologize. But I, I think people are tired of seeing the on day, you know, so people are frustrated. I appreciate your remark, and I appreciate my wife mentioned that someone stood at the last meeting at Josh Wheaton and slammed the impasse, and you, everyone applauded, and you didn't accept it. And I appreciate that, because impasse or any kind of test are a path of life. You know, you're going to test in high school, you're going to test to get into college, law school, medical school. And if we have to teach them what to pass the test, we've got to teach them what to pass the test. We can't run from it. The other communities are doing it. So we, we can talk about changes in the curriculum, transitions, and I've heard that word a lot. But the other schools, a part of Josh Wheaton with inbreeding, seem to be handling things okay. I, I appreciate you being here and just give you a chance to talk and, and those people on the paper are doing that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just a quick comment. Wondering if there's any reevaluation of the Wednesday half days considering the fact that Reading has many professional development days as well as every half day on Wednesday. Surrounding schools do not have that. And is there any discussion about changing that? That's a, you want to so, I was not here when it was first put in. Um, the Wednesdays was actually put in about 30 years ago. And the reason why it was put in was to address um, the inability for contractual planning time to be put in during the school day um, at the elementary level. That practice is held, continues today. The Wednesdays at the elementary level are basically, with, with the exception of 10 Wednesdays, during the year, a planning time. It's not professional development time. And I know that's a misconception that some people think that it's professional development time every Wednesday, it's not. It's contractual planning time because we do not have the staffing during the school day to provide planning time for teachers during the school day. But it's time away from sitting in front of a teacher and learning. Well, to answer your question, ultimately we would love to recoup those Wednesdays back. That requires te additional teachers. Because for the teachers to have planning time during the day, the students need to be somewhere else. So, what about so for, for like a, they have the staffing. For like a to that level, just having been a teacher when it was actually implemented in the district, one of the things that I recall uh, vividly was that our school day was extended on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So we were going short of time. And, and we were still meeting the mandated hours of um, um, 900 hours. Yeah, you, year, the, the elementary schools go 940 hours. You, you have to, we, elementary schools have to go at least 900. So, so, and if anything, I think actually Reading goes to school more than surrounding districts. And I'm not, I'm just bringing that forward so that you know that. I think we do 181 days in most other districts. Well, it was for 189. 189, yeah. oh, take that back. But it was 189. Right. right. Um, but the other thing I'd like to comment on is I'm impressed with, you know, Dr. Darty's statement that he's taking ownership for it. But th I think the most important thing is forget about that. that you know, that, that happened, and we need to move forward. And I can tell you, just like Elaine did, that, you know, I take this very seriously. I know my colleagues take it very seriously. And, you know, we're hearing you. We're listening to you. I've received phone calls. I'll be more than willing to talk to other people about it, as I know other, other school committee members are. But, Essentially, the, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very concerned and I'm motivated to make sure that we move forward. And I, I really want to kind of forget about 
looking back and just sort of, what are we going to do to go forward? I guess that if you don't know what happened and why it happened, how can you Well, that's why we're listening to what you have to say. I just want to share, um, and I, I fear I'm going to be a little repetitive, but I, I will go on after that. I feel the passion in this room, and I've shared it. Um, I have three kids that have been in the school system. Two are out, two are out of college. They were very well prepared for their college experience. But like you, I was in those seats being a sand uh, a piece of sand in the oyster, making sure that what my kids needed were discussed. Um, but I remember going through different times and feeling like now, where we've had this MCAS, the, the four-year decline, we're at a place where we need to regroup, we need to talk together, we need to work together, we don't need to take out our swords and fight with each other. We really need everyone here. I've heard wonderful comments and people are working so hard um, looking at the statistics. But the statistics, the MCAS results, the testing, I know they're important, but they, and I hate to use this phrase, but they're one piece of the puzzle. And everything I've heard reinforces that there is so much more going on that we need to work on together. In terms of math, there have been, I like the idea and I've suggested the idea of finding out how many tutors are being used in school. It's a statistic that we need to reach out and find. The, I've heard concerns about teacher evaluation, well there is now a teacher evaluation process that's in place and this year we'll be adding the student voices to that student evaluation. I think it's important, I think it's being a program that's being rolled out. But one of the differences is that it's not a summative process, it's a formative process. So unlike the MCAS, which gives a number at the end, it gives us something to work on. The formative process is that you have dialogue around what's going on and you have a chance to learn and change and fix, like having math on Wednesdays, like looking at when there are data meetings and there isn't a teacher in the classroom, like ch realizing the sharing, so you brought a lot to our attention, and things are going to happen and things are already happening. The math issue around um, some of the changes, it takes both ways. Change is hard. Math is not like what I learned. I had trouble teaching my kids according to the new program when they first started. So I think that there's change in this, but I'm actually an advocate for some of that change because my daughter, who took problems from scratch and figured it out, was getting marked wrong, and now, People have to look at how she figured it out and see whether it's wrong or see whether she understands it and then take her from there. Her understanding is key, not whether she can perform on a two-hour sit-down test when she's tired, hungry, or had a bad night the night before. There's a lot more going on. In terms of the standard, the standard-based report cards, I sat in on a meeting with the elementary school teachers at the Blue Ribbons um, conference and heard them talking hard and thoughtfully about the balance of conferences and standards-based feedback and the idea being that instead of getting a summative grade, which kids will have all too soon, and you will see there, I don't mean to say it that way, but now my life, I'm looking at these grades feeling, oh, look at all that effort, look at how she tried, look at what she learned, and a grade doesn't necessarily capture that. But with the, what they're trying to do with the standard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the standard-based standard -based report cards are trying to take it back to a skill level so that instead of looking at a letter, parents and teachers can look together at the individual skills that students are trying to learn 
and go back and see how that applies and what work they need to do and how the curriculum can be targeted. I see some disbelief, or, or um, but this is the way I understood it, and I saw those teachers working at this and trying to figure out what would be the best time of year to have the conferences so that you weren't, we, you, in elementary school, weren't just getting this report card, but had the connections so that you'd have the conversations about your children, not just a grade. In terms of homework, it's not about quantity, it's about quality, but I've heard very loud and clear, and I've felt it myself, it's not just about quality, it's also about parental support so that we know how to help our kids when they have homework. So there's a lot that needs to happen, a lot of communication, and I commend everyone that's at this meeting at the end of a long day to come and share your feelings and share your thoughts. We're in this together. There isn't one person in this room, and I know I'm reiterating, that doesn't care about the kids. We are here because we care about the kids. I could be in Ireland right now with my husband, but I'm here <laughs> because I care about the kids and I love this town and I love the school district. So thank you for being here and you do, you are talking to people who care and I commend Craig, Mr. Martin and Dr. Doherty, Craig and John for the work and the effort they're trying to put into this, they are putting into these presentations, to the extra time, to their availability, to parents, to us, with our questions. So, thank you for listening. Hi, Julie Bailoff. Um, I think I'm going to be a fantastic one indicator of how the learning in kindergarten students are doing. But I would guess that a report card is also a second indicator. Has there been any analysis done to see how the MCAT scores look back to how the students' report cards are doing? Has there any set of standards in this report? student individually. Certainly in many cases there's not the correlation that we <coughs> that I mean, you know, what we might have said meeting the standard may not be the case um, on the MCAS. So, you know, it wasn't easy to pull that data. And, and still not yeah, but there's some that disconnect that. in that. So that's clearly something that we're looking at. And that needs to be looked at student by student. Right. I can't grab but that. You can meet the standard and it's still not yep, the concept. So I, I think that maybe is it the report card that's off or well, I mean, it's not so much that, not, for instance, it's certainly a difference with the report card. But if that was really frankly aligned, and if you felt confident that if the student is meeting that standard, it, it absolutely means they are, they are meeting the standard or exceeding the standard or whatever. So to me, it's not so much how that gets reported out, but that whatever it is, whether it's a letter grade or a percentage or, you know, or an M or P or whatever, that it's, that it's absolutely aligned and it has that consistent definition. So yes, but that's aren't they something that we're the looking at. Aren't the standards aligned with each other? That's, that's what I thought we were doing. That's where I'm confused. Right. Well, that's the that is the absolute goal. But as the standards have shifted, for instance, one of the things that we have to make sure what every teacher knows that when we're using those standards based report cards, that what data is being used to determine that. Right. And so as we've been shifting those standards and the data that they use is different, that's something that we have been addressing and working. And clearly that may be a little bit different with each school, which can't be the case. That has to be district-wide. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a uh, question from the committee. Okay. And, and, and I apologize, it's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Um, it has to do with student growth percentile. Last fall was my first year on this committee, and I heard this presentation last year. And we, at the time, said that 50 was, was the goal for our students. We want to be 50 or higher because that is the, you're in, you're in the top half of the state in terms of student growth, which I understood at the time. I'm a little bit concerned. I did hear that tonight, but I also heard, but we're in the 40 to 60 range. And so that's, so I just think it's really important that when we have a, a hurdle, that we, we stick with it. So I would like to just make it clear that if 50 was the goal last year, it's still my goal this year. And there have been significant drops in that. We had four groups under 50 last year. We have nine this year. So um, I just want to clarify that I'm still using 50 as my guideline. 
Um, the question that came up earlier that I really related to was, was the, there's sort of a list of concerns and then there's a list of solutions. And I think going forward, and I'm sure during the budget season we'll be discussing, it'd be great to put them together. It would be, and this goes to the special ed question that was asked. It'd be great to say, we have a concern about this high needs group. Here are the three things we're doing to attack that problem. We have a concern about the math program at the elementary level. Here are the three things. So instead of, and I've been on the slides trying to put them together, oh, that addresses that, this addresses that. I think that would be more strategic and easier to understand. I think then, personally, that's when you talk about resources. When you fully understand the problem and you have a strategy to tackle it, then we talk about reallocating the resources we do have access to. I think we need to be open to solutions that are not just resources, but management decisions. Is 181 days a better number? Maybe we need 180 for state. Sounds like maybe we do. We need to rethink decisions we've made, as well as talk about resources. So I just wanted to say I think that's a good strategy move. That's sort of where my head is at. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank you. Uh, would it be okay if I took questions from people that haven't asked them yet? Uh, Sharon? Yes, um, um, so I first want to thank the Joshua Eaton, um, the SAC, the School Advisory Council, and um, when I hear the frustration in the room and the anger from parents, and I'm feeling it too, when the repeated questions around what, you know, why didn't we notice, I have to say I didn't notice. I didn't notice the school MCAS scores were going down until this year either. And so I'm frustrated at myself for not looking. I just looked at my own kids' scores, and that was that. So, um, but as I see the power of this group, and I see what the communication can do when the school and the parents are working together in a way where they're really looking at what's going on in the school, they're looking at the school improvement plan. They, they'd notice those numbers. If that group had been you know, able to really function well, I think, in the past, and I'll guarantee that they'll notice, they'll be on those numbers like, you know, white on snow from now on. I mean, it's really, it's exciting. So my wish, I guess, is, uh, well, my question is, is there any thought in the district about really standardizing the use of those groups and strengthening them? Could every school have a folder that has the meeting schedule, the members of the SAC, the minutes, the school improvement plan in it? Could um, the parents maybe, uh, the SAC is also empowered to send out surveys to parents it can ask questions about, you know, do you, what do you see going on? And, um, what are your concerns? And what ideas do you have for saving revenue? And what ideas do you have for improving outcomes? And that, that data would have to be reported back. So that's a resource that I think if we use that well, we wouldn't necessarily have all this pent up anger later when a problem comes, it would be preventative. And um, I think we could really take this great energy and investment and work in a better collaborative partnership. Because I think a lot of us did get complacent because everything was fine. <laughs> and now it isn't. And so um, I'd love to see that collaboration stronger as we move ahead. And I thank you for the surveys and for um, really being willing to sit through these uncomfortable meetings. And it would be great if there was a more preventive way to prevent the problems and prevent the anger. So, thank you. Questions from folks that maybe haven't had a chance? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I hope. You know, the answer to that is yes. Um, that has actually been happening in some schools. It's not been consistent across the district, so yes. Answer your question. Thank you. If you go on each individual school's website, it should be there. I did. And we have to make sure it is. No, that's what I'm saying. We have to make sure it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Thank yeah, you. sorry. Um, I think I might be able to help clarify some of this. I have a current fourth and fifth grader, and a lot of what's going on here is because math was not taught, not just on Wednesday, but when I met with Dr. Darby the other day, and I went back, when my kids' MCAS were one did 27% on fractions and one did 33% on fractions. And when we sat up and eaten that night and it was a like, oh gosh moment, what happened? They weren't taught. The fourth graders, the third graders never made it to the chapter of fractions last year. And the fourth graders made it, it was chapter six, I believe, and they were doing it. I don't even think they were at chapter six when the MCAS happened. 
And I'm the one who had the completely empty math book that's about 60% of the math program that was never taught last year. And I had the, the uh, vocabulary workbook, same thing, less than 50% of the vocabulary was taught last year. So my question is, when you brought in this Singapore math, was the intent to teach five out of 14 chapters in the school year, or is the curriculum a 14 chapter curriculum that should have been taught? Because it's no surprise to me, my kids don't have scores because they weren't taught it. And the material they were taught, they scored 89% on. When you get two subjects with 27%, you know, I don't, it took me four minutes to look that up. And we spent hours discussing what happened with math. It wasn't taught, plain and simple. Why wasn't it taught? Who wasn't teaching it? What is going to change? And why did we pay all this money to bring in a program that was not properly implemented? The teachers weren't trained more than a few weeks in advance. They're still being trained. And, and I'm not talking MCAS. I'm talking that was, that's what highlighted what was going on for my kids' education. No, I'm not low income, and no, my son isn't high needs. He's high needs now, in my opinion, but he's not going to get anything. So I now have to figure out how to teach him a program that he's now in. It's supposed to be building on the year. Yet, what are they building on? Or are they only going to get to chapter six this year? Which, as Pam Higgins stated, it looks pretty much like that's the case. And we're losing another 50, 60 percent of the curriculum again. And off they go to middle school, and off they go on, on the math track that you know takes them right through high school. And did number five and six for me for kids. I've been in these schools. I've seen every curriculum come in and be implemented. This was so poorly put through these schools. And I, you know, all these other things are great to talk about. You have to figure out why wasn't it taught? And why am I sitting with an empty workbook? And is that the 20% they lost last year? Are they going to take that and do that on Wednesdays? Because our email was the two who will be in the room will figure out what people need help with. They need help with chapter 7 through 14. <laughs> <laughs> so how is that going to be addressed? Who says, okay, great idea. We did five and a half chapters out of 14 last year in fourth grade. And how do they catch up on that the next year? Right? right. And where's the accountability? How do you catch up? But you kind of Math isn't something you just catch up on. Right. You learn it and, and you work your way through it, right? I, I mean, and these kids are, are just falling further and further behind, and sooner or later they're just going to give up. So, how do, how do we get them there? What, what are the steps? There, yeah, what was the pace they were supposed to be teaching at? So, we have and, and the Word and Why program. Who decided nine out of 20 chapters was adequate for fourth grade? To me, if you buy that curriculum, you teach the whole curriculum. You don't teach you don't teach a little bit of math. And you let the parents know what is the expectation. And so yeah, at the I beginning of the year, they know. Math. So that they're looking at the bar and asking questions yeah. sooner than a year or two or three well, we don't later. Get so we don't know where they are. I didn't even know there were 14 chapters in the book until last year. We get to where you want to go with that road map. You don't get road maps. Yeah. And that was just to make sure that it's district-wide. Because um, clearly there is too much of a variation. So we need a pace now. If we're, if we're still reviewing chapter two in in fourth grade math right now. We're on that same track. To maybe hit five. We get into the holidays and vacations and throwing all the substitutes. We'd be lucky to hit six chapters with the rate they're going. And now that they have no homework. There's, if they maybe had some homework, maybe they could speed this pace up a bit. But my kids at home have almost nothing every night. And that's scary. And I, I don't want to hear we want kids to have more fun and homework is bad. <laughs> it's not bad in this situation. It's what's absolutely needed right now. Can I just echo on that? Because I actually feel like the MCAS were just like, it, it, it got everyone's attention, but these problems have been building for years. I have two fifth graders that I feel like, you know, that the school Josh Wheaton just experimented on. Yes. They switched from <laughs> the third yes. grade when they, and it was immediately apparent in November at parent-teacher conferences, every, almost every single parent complained about switching. It was too early for them. They weren't emotionally ready for it. And yet, 
they just continued it on through the third grade. Fourth grade, they switched again. Fourth grade, they had widespread absenteeism among the fourth grade teachers. Nothing was done about it. And now they're in fifth grade, and you know what? Their scores suffered, and my children suffered because the school, in my opinion, was very poorly run. The kids were in the third grade. I think um, you know we are hearing consistency across the district is much needed with homework, with math, with the expectations, rituals, the whole bit. Um, is there communication amongst the schools to get on the same page, one, but two, you've talked about hiring strategy company to come in, a consultant to analyze. How is it that Joshua Eaton is the only school that did not make the mark on the MCAT? Is Joshua Eaton the only one that's not teaching math? Why spend the money, and I'm not saying we don't do this, but why spend money on a consultant when we have schools in the district that are making the mark, that are doing it, and doing it very well. How is it that we are going to spend money on a consultant when are we, are we talking to the other schools and are we pulling what they're doing well and implementing it? And who's, who's accountable for that? Well, Who I'm makes hiring, that happen? We're not hiring a consultant. Uh, no, that was for special education to take a look at our programs. Is that being done? Are you communicating throughout the district how each school is doing this? Are they all doing it consistently? About special you education? Or? Students, uh, yeah, at Grand Sweden, but not at other schools. I think, What's the I think I'll let Craig answer that piece because I think it ties in with the PLCs. Yeah, I do. I think that the PLC structure that I was talking about is calling upon the teachers from the big, different schools. They together that, um, are making sure that we have consistent pacing guides, that they have consistent ways of informing parents chapter by chapter of what's happening, because there's way too much variation. Everyone? That's everyone. That's everyone. The things that we're doing is, is, is pertaining to every school. There are particular things like some of the coaching and things about the new standards that we're going to put more of an emphasis in Joshua Eaton. Just because no, this isn't everything. It's just a no, right here in math, I said uh, right here at this bullet right here, I should have numbered them. Okay. Right? That clearly this was something, you know, as was bringing up tonight, that we identified. That was a problem. Right? In that first year of implementation. Way too wide of a variation. Well, it's been every year, not just yeah. the first year. Well, but this was the first year of this program. That's what I mean. Well, the I know, but a school not having yeah. math is yeah. being the, was yeah. it the only school yeah. that didn't have math on their site? Craig, yes. I think that the Josh Wheaton parents here who are scared to death that their fifth graders are going to show up at Parker and not stand a chance of getting on what might be where they really ought to be in the math track nightmare that it is, I think they need to know what all the other elementary schools are doing right now, where are their third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders across the board. So these parents can have a clear understanding, is my kid behind? How behind? And how are we going to catch up? That seems like something they need to know in one week. I agree. Because if they don't get the answer, then we need to hire a tutor, which many of my friends have done. Some of us have pulled our kids and are paying for private school and hoping college works out because of issues of the culture of that school. Yes. And it needs to be solved quickly. Everyone here knows that. I just have a question about sort of the, I'm sorry, this is going to take a few minutes, but I have a question about there's a 14 step action plan there, and this is one agenda. I've heard repeatedly that there is discussions about the, res the district being under resourced and that the budget projections for future fiscal years is not good. And so my overall concerns are that the system as a whole is going to be asked to do more with less, which it sounds like has been something that's been consistent. And it's going to be stretched by having to engage in multiple initiatives when it's already under-resourced, according to what's been said, and then try and focus on a hundred million things. 
And to me, that it's a struggle for me and that it sounds like a recipe for disaster. And so my question in all of this is, um, I understand that this is sort of a gathering of information and it's part of a process. And so my larger question is to sort of the group is, what are the priorities of the committee and the district? At what point in time would additional resources in terms of discussions with the town be taken in to sort of say, all right, you know what, we really can't, you know, you kind of reach a point in some things where things are bad enough where you say, look, it, it really doesn't matter if we come in under budget this year or at budget because the things are bad. And I, it's just kind of a larger discussion of the larger framework of things that's been hinted at throughout the meeting. Thank you. We had, um, at our financial forum last week, the guidance we received from the town was to expect a 2.5% increase in our budget when we start planning in the next month. And that's interesting because when you read that in the paper, you think 2.5% increase. Interesting, there might be something we can do there, right? But it doesn't cover our expenses from last year. So we have contractual expenses with salaries. 2.5% uh, increase to our budget is more like a, and I'll get the percent wrong, but it's more like a 2, 2.5% two decrease to our budget. So going into next year's budget, if you were to look at last year's budget, we're looking at a $900,000 deficit. Now, it's uh, unfortunately, it's nothing new, but I, I, I didn't clearly hear tonight that, I did not clearly hear tonight that we can solve this problem with money, and that's not what the committee is doing. The committee is trying to figure out how to run this district as best as we can with the resources we have available. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I do think it's important for everyone to hear that when you start reading about the 2.5% increase, it, it's not. So I think that's, I, I hope I'm making that clear. Our priorities are fixing this problem. Our priorities are trying to do what's best for every single kid in this town, and it's always been that way. I don't, I don't, I, I hope that, I don't feel as though that was a strong enough answer, and I welcome the committee to offer the vote. This is what. I just want to say, so from a process perspective, the committee will begin discussing budget priorities. So um, over the next coming months, I guess really probably starting in, um, later in November, and then all the way right up through town meeting in April, um, it's really about the budget. And so people are certainly invited and the agenda is posted in advance for specific items. So I encourage you to um, continue to stay really involved in part of that process. So it will be, it will be a uh, very, very <coughs> difficult season of how do we make choices. Whatever choice we make, a decision to fund something is a decision to not fund something else that's just as important to someone else, whether it be a high school parent or an elementary parent across town. So it, it's going to be extremely challenging and uh, we can't, but we can't um, just go. Um, by the way, like you can't just go over budget. So this, so it's so it's a, it's a, it's something that you know we have to really do work with the town. Um, but again, I think Chris, I did highlight there's there's things that we can do that may not, um, you know, that may not be, may not require a lot of resources, and we have the Title One money that we can focus for this specific. No, and I think what I'm trying to get at is that piece around um, the priorities. So the MCAS is the priorities, and what are the other priorities of the school system? You know, because this is one part of it, and then what are the resources that, and this is the buzzword that sort of gets picked up by ears, is when I hear reallocated, like you said, it means one thing gets funded and something else doesn't. Dr. Jordan. So I, I want to I wanna clarify what you just said, because I don't think MCAS is the priority. Teaching and learning is the priority. And I want to make that very clear. Our job is not to raise MCAS scores. Our job is to increase teaching and learning for our students. Now, that should equate to higher MCAS scores. But, um, so that's one piece. Now, in terms of the goals of the district, we essentially, um, we have two goals that we've been focused on and will continue to be focused on. One, fortunately, is going to be funded through a grant. 
over the next five years. And that's the implementation of MTSS, which actually helps teaching and learning. Because it's putting in structures for students to receive interventions when they are struggling, both academically, socially, emotionally. So that's, that's big. Um, the second is to build the capacity of our kids and our teachers so that they can increase teaching and learning. Those are really our two goals. Um, and we've been focused, those are the two <coughs> goals of all the principals, the Central Office Administration, myself. Um, those are our two goals for this, for this district. If I can just, one more, because um, is this the first of the three slides? Yes. Okay. So, and, and Craig had alluded to this earlier. These are things that are going on or are about to start in this district. These are things that we've been, we started doing last year, are continuing this year. Um, so these are already happening are, and are going on. This will help address the two goals, okay? The next slide, I think it's the next slide, okay? These are the things that we need to do to increase the sustainability of those two goals. These are additional resources, some of it is personnel, some of it is programs, the way we do things now, some of it is space. These are the things that we need additional funding for. So we do have a plan, we do have a vision of where we need to go. Some of it we can do right now, some of it we can't do right now, because we, we require additional resources. So I don't know if that helps or... I, I think it helps Seth, but I think it's, for me, like I said, I don't want to just get bogged down in the money part of it, because I realize I'm a social worker by trade, I understand larger systems and the struggles of staying within it. But again, it, it has to do with sort of, in echoing the sentiments in the room around sort of what's being done now, and then for my own edit clarification is, what are the steps and the processes that need to happen and the time frames associated with, well, getting the things that you can't allocate right now? What does that need to know so that when I go home tonight and I give a report to my wife, I don't have to listen to an hour of, what the heck did you sit there for three hours for? If you can't do it. What's gonna be new and when something's gonna be implemented? Unfortunately, we're not live tonight, so. I actually know his wife, so he's not kidding. But, uh, <laughs> so, a couple things. I think that, you know, thank you. I appreciate you guys being here tonight. I mean, almost three hours is impressive for any school committee meeting. It's my first one. But I think the theme that I'm coming back to consistently is that we are the only district, uh, JE, the only district out of all the school districts here that is failing. And I, I'm hearing some emotion from the, from the committee. And Dr. Dordy, I appreciate you taking ownership of this right now. But I'm just not seeing a, a plan to accountability. And I'm not looking for heads to roll. I'm just looking for Basically, and everybody else that works here, you have a 30, 60, 90 plan. If something's not working, you have to take action and prove it. I see a long list of things they're trying to do, but I don't see any priority. And I'd love to see some accountability and say, look, here's our 30, 60, 90 day plan. We're gonna come back to this group in 90 days with accountability. We'll be halfway through the year in 90 days. So I'd love to hear that from the school committee and kind of talk, there's something's not working. Four years decline, there's a steady decline. Something's gotta be done. I'm just, I'm just not seeing that right now. So I'd love to, you know, I don't wanna keep beating a dead horse here, but. Unfortunately, I just think there's not any accountability being taken. I, I'm trying to, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to debate. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you're looking for an answer. I think it was probably more of a comment, but I think it's a theme. It's a theme that we keep kind of and reiterating our, our position, and I think that you're getting it. I think you're particularly getting it. Thank you very much for the comment, then, sir. Yes. So, uh, Chris Kelly president of the Reading Education Foundation, educator and another neighboring community. Two comments. Uh, first of all, as far as your priorities, that's part of why DESE makes a district inherit the accountability of the school that could be in trouble, whether it's level two or three or whatever, to really put pressure on the district, not just Reading, but any district, to say this has to be your priority school. Because you're right, there's, all, there's never enough money. <coughs> Education, social work, medicine, we never have the money to do what we want to do. Um, but this is going to be a priority for writing. I can see it in the room. I, I know most of these people. And I can see that they care very much about improving the situation. Second comment, um, 
I work in a neighboring community that was in a very similar situation three years ago and sat in front of a group of people like this as the principal with probably three times as many angry parents at the meeting. And when you ask time frames, it, it takes time. Three years later, we're in a really good spot. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of difficult conversations. And for your kids in those, you know, fifth grade, you're like, we don't have the time. Education's different than business. You can't just go in there and change a widget and fix it. It does take time to really peel back the layers and say, how we've got really good teachers at Josh Wheaton. My kids went there too until we were redistricted. We most of them are still there. Many of them are. They're really committed people that want to do well. But they also have to sit down and say, okay, what can we do better? Let's roll up our sleeves. That takes time. I think you're going to see progress next year. You're going to see progress the next year after that. It's going to take three or four years, just like, unfortunately, sometimes an implementation dip takes three or four years before the writing's on the wall, and you're like, wow, we need more support or something needs to get done. So, you know, I, I just want to say, as somebody who's been through this before, I know patience is, isn't easy, but your kids are in good hands. They are with people who really care. I agree that pacing and curriculum mapping is essential. That can be done Im immediately. These programs come with curriculum maps. They come with pacing guides. You know, the administrators, Craig could sit down and work right this week with the staff and say, these are the get goal, you know, by the end of November, this has to be done. And we can do that. You can do that. We just want to see that. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. We need to see what's the plan, yep. what's the map. Get these kids back on track. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Um, my oldest daughter is in seventh grade with Josh, Josh Wheaton, and I'm sure like Laura is speaking. It's a completely different school now in the past four years. The teachers were more engaged <laughs> when she went through it. It, it really stems from the top. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's a completely different school. With the, all the same teachers, to her point, it's all the same teachers. Back to Carl's comment, and a lot of what we're hearing is we want to see something measurable. That we know there's stuff you're doing. I think you're giving us a you know 10,000 feet look at it. We want you to come down to the details. We want to understand what it is that you're looking at and how do we know that we're making progress. You know, it, it can be things you know like when to open. Right. We, you know, what what steps are we taking? Like when are we going to implement those pacing guides? Like, how is that happening? What are you expecting to see as a result from that? And it's not going to be every single detail that we're looking for. There's plenty of things you'd be managing on your own. But we want to know what are those critical steps. How can we tell if we're making progress? We don't want to wait until next year that we have presentation to find out, you know, well, we rolled the dice and we did or we didn't make progress. I, to also back to the comment on the report cards, I think even as a short-term step, it would be incredibly helpful for us as parents to have, for the first term, for the second term, for the third term, what does an average student look like per grade? If I see a report card full of Ps, is that good or bad in the first term? Because nobody knows. Like we know we're supposed to see all rounds by the end, but how do we know if we should be taking steps? It's going to be individual conferences to have those discussions in depth about what the standard looks like. And that's what's happening. So every other school gets the new report. Where are your Yes, that's across the street. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sir, in the back. Oh, yeah. I just I wanted to go back to a comment. Um, someone brought up the switching of the classes, which I was glad that they did. Um, that's been a source of frustration for us. Um, and so I guess my question was, or is, on the, um, on the switching, my understanding was that the schools had a decision whether or not they wanted to implement the switching. And I was just curious to know of the five or, what is it, the five elementary schools, how many actually are doing the switching and at what grades, and how many are not the, switching? The switching actually went to district-wide decision on that. It's grades four and five. Up, up in, for the last couple of years, where's, how has that been happening? 
I mean, so you're saying that's happening now, right? So now everyone's switching fourth and fifth across all the schools. If, well, we're phasing it over the next two years. Some of them have been doing four and five, well, some question. haven't. So the question is, which ones have been doing it and which ones haven't been doing it for the last couple of so years? So if we go back to third grade. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I honestly don't know. I, I don't, I don't, yeah. honest, I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. I don't want to say it. erroneous yeah. information. Yeah. We can find it. Thank you. Yes. So we, we talk about, you know, we, we want measurable. So going back to the actual curriculum, the math and the and the worldly wise, the ELA, what is the expectation for the teachers? How far in that curriculum are they supposed to get in a school year? The goal would be to complete the curriculum. Okay. So at what point is there an intervention when Doesn't 10 weeks in you've done two chapters? And I know for instance at a, a, a neighboring school community that has math and focus, their fourth grade class are on chapter five, ours are still reviewing chapter two. At what point does, does the administration step in and say, we're 10 weeks in, we're on chapter two, we need to complete 14 chapters, how are we gonna get there? So what, what is that, how, what does that process look like? So I think clearly that's gonna have to be communicated. When I say complete the curriculum too, I don't wanna, give the sense that every topic or every unit is the same duration. Right. It's not, so that's what the, the pacing guide is about. Um, so that will be coming coming home to the, to the parents. That's something that we are establishing right now, because but, clearly that wasn't. But, but how, long, how often, yes. do, you, how often yes. do you check with the teachers on that? How often you do you check last year? They were so far behind. It became very clear last year that there became wide variation as the year went on. When did that become clear? Which is what we're seeing in the sports. So the question is, you know, if we're looking at this, can we find out where the other schools are? If we're in the level three status right now, the, level, the other four elementary schools, and they're in chapter four, and we're still in chapter two, it goes back to kind of the root cause, there's issues, and we need to kind of pull back to the onion, if you will. So I mean, how do we, do we are you doing that? Are you but able to do that? Can you tell us? Like, I don't even think it's, it's even to even compare amongst other elementary schools, because the reality is, is there's a 14 chapter book, and they're only, Sick. So I, I, if, if this is a process, what is the time frame? I mean, are, are the teachers, is the administration, do they check in with the teachers on a weekly, a, a bi-weekly, monthly basis to see where are we, what do we need to do to pick up the pace so that we get the full curriculum in? Just wondering what that, that it must be outlined in the schools, right? It must be a process in place. Yep. There? So that's done through the administration in each building. The teachers are actually meeting this Thursday this time, and one of the things that the third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers are doing is looking at that sequence to see where they are, how much variation is happening right now. I mean, there sometimes is some variation with, with between school to school, um, grade level to grade level, depending on what else has occurred in the, in the calendar, but it should be fairly close, so that's what they're in the process of looking at right now. And then yes, we have to make create strategies for seeing if there is some variation, how we get them back on. Because I know, I know Ms. Keene said that it's 80% of the class has to master. reach master, master the mastery. mastery before they can move on. So I know that that's part of the issue, in the, so at least in the third and fourth I can speak to. 80% has not been reached yet in chapter two, so you have a majority of the kids sitting there doing nothing while they're waiting for that additional, the, the additional kids to meet that 80%. Could it go this one another two weeks? Well, and that's, that's why everybody's getting an M, because they're meeting the very few standards that they're actually being taught. <laughs> that's what I'm having to differentiate. No, seriously. Well, I mean, exactly. Our standards are to meet, then you met it. I'm still trying to get it straight. Uh, you had a, uh, wait. Uh, I think this question was answered. Was, was, was there answered? a private question? Um, this question answered? No. I don't think no, this question was answered. I'm moving on. I made that mistake before. Um, I'm here. I'm sorry. One more moment. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm getting tired. Of it. Sorry. I think you had a question that wasn't answered. Yeah, I, I just I want to understand. There, there must be a framework in place for for that. So I'm wondering where. By what method are you using? So you yeah, want to see the math and the pacing guide so that we can see where are your students in that particular grade level in compared <laughs> to to other schools. You know, how much of a variation do we have in that? And so the teachers are looking at that and making sure 
that that's being communicated to, to the parents. One of the other things that we found last year, and it came from this group, that some of the, even from the program itself, the parent guides that are going to be included in each chapter Don't are not guess. necessarily being used consistently. No. Um, yeah. We didn't get the passwords until two weeks ago. That's one issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, miss, uh, and I apologize. I wrote you a question. That, no, um, I was actually talking to the woman. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, uh, um, I wrote you a question about I think it's an important question, and I don't know if it, you, you heard what you wanted to hear. I, I would like to take the next question, but I'm, I, I did I did note that particular question. Thank you. Yes, thank you for waiting. Uh, I actually am a parent, a very parent, but I'm also here because I'm a, in my fourth year as a Title I teacher, and my second year as a Title I coordinator for the town. Um, I see this as a resource problem. I worked, uh, the town that I worked in prior to this year was Lexington, and they had you know, a curriculum coordinator for math. They had a curriculum coordinator for literacy. Under that, they had literacy coaches. I was one of the literacy coaches. They had <coughs> literacy specialists. They had math specialists. I mean, if you want consistency and you want everybody teaching the same chapter, I just think that's where we might need to focus in the future for budget. Um, you know, I think we're doing the best we can. I see the teachers working tirelessly. Um, I wrote the uh, Title I grant after we had this designation, and I worked around the clock trying to think of ways to spend the money in the most effective way based on the data. And so I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that at any point and you know, get feedback. So just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> I mean, she's really the only educator in the school well, that has shown up. I but I, I do appreciate <laughs> It's nice to have people show up for these meetings. It would be nice if Karen was here to address some of these. It seems like a lot of the accountability might be falling there and she's not here to even address it. You know, we've all taken time out of our schedules to come with babysitters and you know, it's not easy. We get it. The approach is to make sure that the class is able to move forward and interventions are able to come into place if, if students still learn. I mean, clearly you can't be, you can't just stall um, while the rest, you know, depending on the percentage. She said that this morning. That is 80% of that. What was that? Who said this part? common theme we're hearing in this room, without trying to do a lynching, is that there's a concern at the top. That's one thing. The second thing is, I'm very happy to see increased academic-based after-school activities and clubs on there. And I think that can be a ridiculously low budget item for the overall community. And I think this group would be happy to participate overall. Maybe I'm speaking for some of you when I shouldn't be, but you're here, so I'm going to make that safe assumption. One thing I'll also say that we've learned going through some of the 
communities that we've all joined as a result of this issue, is that Josh Wheaton used to have Mac Olympia. Two years ago, three years ago, it stopped. As a result of some of the other things that are going on. Morale-wise, is the understanding that it stopped because of the morale. And that is extremely concerning. Mm -hmm. That that kind of activity that can help those students that have mastered it two weeks ago go on to do other things is stopped because of morale issues within the school. If that's in true, in fact, true. That's the going rumor, for lack of a better way to say it. <laughs> With that said, I will say this. The map, the, the morning map program has been a, a, a very good thing over the last three or four weeks. But it started with a focus on bringing the lower learners up. Those of us that asked, that had potentially forward learners that could move forward, were told it's not for you. Until enough student left parents put their kids in anyway and forced the event that there would be a morning math for forward learners. I think we're, we're spending a lot of time focusing on, and I, I recognize it's a need, but I really think we need to spend more time as well focusing on those that can move forward. This whole 80% thing that Ms. Feeney said this morning is crazy, crazy talk, if that's in fact what's going on. Um, and it goes back to the greater question, and I would encourage and ask the school board to go think about a gifted and talented type program or other things that can help raise the bar up a little bit. As the bar, as the ship rises, other things can come in. You talk about this theory that a group bringing everybody together in one thing will raise the lower up. If the top is bored, nothing's going to happen, and that's what we're facing. The top is absolutely and utterly bored. So what can we do to improve the top and drive it up? That's the question. I don't think that's something we can answer right now. I, I don't think it, we can at this point. So let me ask you at this, at this hour, at this time, let me ask it's a, a longer conversation. I'll ask you a different question that maybe is more direct, considering the budget constraints. Is a gifted and talented program explicitly too expensive considering the budget constraints in Israel? I don't know how to answer that. I, I Do you want to try to answer that? No, I, um, so I, we have no idea what that would cost. This, is, this has been a topic that's been talked about over the years. So my kids are 21 to 16 now. And this d dialogue about gifted and talented, I can tell you, went on back then in 1995. So what at the time was, there was a lot of focus on differentiating instruction. So when I hear what I've heard tonight, I'm like, okay, where's the differentiation? When my kids were in elementary school, there was differentiated instruction. There was an opportunity for those kids who had gotten all that <coughs> stuff. Now maybe it was just worksheets, or maybe it was MIT scratch on a computer in the media center, whatever it was, but it was something that allowed that. So I think, you know, again, there's there's ways to do some of those things that don't take a lot of budget money. But I, I really, I just, um, the uh, Title I specialist who spoke earlier, I'm sorry, it was Allison. rude. Allison, Allison, okay, it was a little rude. John and I were talking and I, he, we had just said, because it's been my thing, I fought and fought and fought to not lose Dr. Redford, instructional specialist and the curriculum coaches. Because those people would be the people who could help support the teachers and enable the differentiation in the classroom. So they could do that. This district, since I've been on this committee in 2003 and since I've been a parent sitting where you guys are all sitting now, a budget parent, we have not put the resources in. So while I agree that number 304 out of 326 is not the right, is not all of the data we need to look at, one of the things we're not doing, this is intimate to teaching and learning. And so I think, you know, if we wanted to pursue, how do we make sure that we're addressing, you know, the kids who need more support, the kids in the middle who also just get sort of ignored, and the kids on the high end who, you know, are really bored. And then they can become troublemakers in class. Okay, so I got, I got that part. So we don't need, you know, we don't need more troublemakers in class when they're bored. So I, I really think that, you know, the, the focus on curriculum and instruction specialists is something that could address that, but I totally agree that we need, you know, the full spectrum. I could just add to that too. Um, I, I taught in a district as an administrator.
administrator in district where we did have those, and it's definitely beneficial. Um, some of the things that we're able to do is uh, things that are hard to do under the circumstances. We would do a data drill down, we would work with PLCs, teachers would collaborate and see, you know, what's going on in your school, how about your scores. We had a very similar situation with one of our schools that was low performing and um, they were able to, I just went online to check and see what they're doing, they're doing great. So, but, but as was stated, it doesn't happen overnight. But I do, I'm not so sure about the 80% thing, but I know a teacher very intimately who tells me she pretty much does 12 lesson plans, or, or at least that many, for a specific subject, be it math, be it language arts, whatever. So that goes back to what you were saying, Elaine. There are teachers, and I would be totally shocked if they weren't doing that at Josh Wheaton, that's differentiating the instruction. I mean, that's just, it's, it's a common practice now. It's, very, it's quite a challenge for teachers to do that. Um, you know, think of trying to, you know, develop one lesson plan and then differentiate it so that it meets the needs of all their students. That's the expectation. And, and um, you know, I, so I'm a little challenged by that 80% thing, but I do, I would have to think that they were doing that. It's, it's, a, it's not just a school-wide approach. It doesn't just happen at this particular school. It happens it's across the country. May I please just say something to that? Because I think that ideally, I think you're right. And I know some of the teachers at Josh Wheaton, one just retired, sadly. But I mean, these, these women, mostly, are pros. And they can do that. But in a situation that's very top down, and that is not working at the top, there's a very crude expression, and I'm not going to say it, but if you know what rolls downhill, that's what's happening. And when you get a culture where the morale is down, where the science Olympiad teacher says, I'm not doing this anymore, when the woman who puts snowshoes on for the kids and off they go tromping through the snow, can't do it anymore because now she's moving third graders around and trying to keep them all from, from so. their heads exploding. When, when the culture of the school changes as it has done in the last five, Four years, I can talk to that, and I think these women and men here can talk to it longer. Then you lose those teachers. You have teachers who literally sneak in interesting snuff stuff for their kids. Literally, knock three times. I'll meet you outside with the kids. It shouldn't be that way. It should be that those teachers, those so, pros. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sorry, I'm, I'm blah blah blah. No, 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 but. May I, Elaine said, we have, a, we have a problem in this district with spending money. And one of the reasons why the principal is currently in place is because there wasn't a, a, a search. So if, okay. if elementary school principals are hired in this district, I would strongly encourage the board to do a search. Thank because you, I think elementary you. school principals are really Please, thank you, and I get it. I, I, I've heard some Concerns about administrative, I, I think the committee has heard that. I don't want to hear it for the remainder of this. And I appreciate it. I'm letting you know I heard it. I do not think it's appropriate for us to be talking about that right now. So I, I apologize. And I'm, I'm, I honestly am trying to get to as many of your questions and concerns. We did hear that point. Thank you. In the red, yes? Um, I just have one comment. What I expected to see tonight is um, going specifically to grade four math drop at Josh Eaton was that Wood End also had the same 60%. You know, we're not talking high knees, we're talking a majority of the students didn't get their math. So you had two schools who did it wrong and three schools did it right. So it's not a curriculum because three kids, three schools did it and there wasn't one slide addressing the school differences. Um, and I think someone else said the slides are way up high. I'd like to see the specifics because as Kim pointed out, they're halfway through the year and we shouldn't have to open last year's math book to see what they missed. I think it's the job of the superintendents to be, okay, these two schools both failed in a certain area. Or maybe they didn't, but I still don't know that. And you've had the data since, my understanding you've had the data since March. And I don't know if it's fractions they should be trying to catch up on or I mean, 
I just, I, I believe it's the date in March. August. 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 So I don't know which, we're high, yeah. high three tutors, and that's fantastic, but no one has said what subject, where, where deficient. I mean, that's what I'd like to see. Who's going to get the tutors? I mean, right. Who's I, getting the tutors? I would have thought <coughs> my son would have been five. Me too. My daughter's <laughs> here. Oh, but it's not an individual tutor when it's 60% of the kids. Right. If 60% right. well, is it's not individual. Right. And it's not my needs. And I would like to say one more thing. I am upset that that was highlighted for why we are level three. That is, my understanding, that is not why we are level three. No. Not because of our high needs group not performing. Well, I do think that's a key part of it. It's I do. a part, correct? Yeah, a lot. I mean, if both parts are very hard key. And why if you take one, one or the other? Put on there. Well, because the difference that we're seeing in the high needs was pretty, pretty significant. That's, so that's absolutely so I have 60% of the kids not being proficient yeah. in math. Yeah. 60% of the fourth grade in class the, in not proficient. I believe so yeah. Karen told me that there were three high needs kids in the grade four group. So we're not, I don't see that grade four as being a high needs, not needing the growth. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I, do, I, I do appreciate the point. Your point was that that Um, well, Craig is looking for uh, I just, it's quarter, it's quarter past ten. I got no place to be. Um, uh, my, my brain is a little, get, getting a little tired, uh, and I apologize, and I don't want to come across curt. Uh, would it be okay for those people who have their hands up for questions if you could do it one more time? I see one, two, uh, it's done, three, four. Is that, would, would it be okay if that was it for this evening? Would they just assured promise that the conversation will continue? <coughs> Anybody have comments? Yeah, you're just right up right, very confident. Did you share with us your email addresses? Of course. They're wrong. So, so are, all of the, no, they're wrong. What a great, uh, I, so with your hands up, I, I promise I will get to you. And, and if no more hands go up, I, I promise I'll be in a better mood when we meet. Um, Sir, all of our email addresses are on Edline, uh, and after the meeting, we certainly just give it to you. But if you went to Edline and looked, no, uh, we could. But if you went to Edline and looked, all of our email addresses are right there. Mr. Martins, did you have a comment regarding the last question I saw you going? No, I just uh, I want to come back to the slide, slide, but I was thinking I had the other screenshot as well from the Joshua Eaton case, which also says something about the level three and focus on the high needs. Um, that's on the, on the um, state website. Miss, yeah. My question is on the title one, and he brought up the morning mash, which is a great thing, a lot of people do it. Is that going to still be a risk if we use title one? Because title one won't for certain groups. Is Did I bring up morning mash? I'm sorry. No. Oh. No. Okay. <laughs> so would that take away the morning mash? Um, you know, that's all being decided still, but what I'm, today I spoke with the fourth and fifth grade teachers that run that, and they would like to keep doing it, and I think it's a great program, so I think they should keep doing it, and then we'll use our Title I funds in other ways. I just wanted to um, echo Mr. Wise's comments. Um, uh, we do a spell-a-thon at Joshua Eaton. My kids come home every year. I have four kids, um, and they already know how to spell all of the words. If we have to send them out to raise money, spell words that are grade appropriate that they already know. And if you, we don't participate in a spell -a I'd rather write a check, have my kids do something that is actually work for them to earn the money. I think it's the wrong message to send to them to go out and raise money when there's no work involved. I did raise this issue with Karen Feeney and our past PTO president. This was a number of years ago. And the response that I got was that, as I said, why can't we do a spelling bee? Why can't we celebrate a kid that can spell better than anybody else, than any adult in the room? Why can't we celebrate some children? And the response <coughs> I got was that it was gonna create anxiety for the first kid that gets out. That was the response that I got. Karen Feeney actually never even weighed in on the response. I did, I did copy her on that. But we are so afraid of creating, nobody remembers the first kid that got out. Everybody remembers, and kids are proud of 
of achieving something. And we are not providing that. And a spelling bee doesn't cost anything. And it gives the kids an opportunity to rise. The kids that maybe aren't getting their needs met in the math class, it's another opportunity <coughs> to choose to participate or not. But to not offer it for fear, that's the wrong thing to teach our kids. I have two points, and one was exactly that, is that I'm extremely disappointed, I don't know if it's town-wide or just the dog community, that we don't celebrate <coughs> academic achievement. Um, we have the Jaguar dog, and we celebrate the fastest runners. We have the art show, and we celebrate the great artists. Um, we have spots for children who behave well, but we do nothing to celebrate academic achievement. And the spelling bee is something that, it just really gets to me, because we are celebrating the children who have the richest family and friends and we give them all sorts of accolades, what about the students that are, can actually spell? And it just, I don't know if it's town-wide, but it really does upset me. The other one's um, a question. At the last meeting, um, October 8th, it was mentioned that the teachers were going to be filling out, I believe it was a CLE form, a questionnaire. Is that something we'll get the results for? Is that something that's private within the administration? No, so with, um, that's the survey that they're going to be taking the same survey you're going to take. Oh, so they haven't taken it yet. No, what they did, and we, we were confused at the time when we first talked to the DSAC, we thought we had to fill in the rubric. So when we met with the DSAC after that October 8th meeting, um, what they said was, no, no, we're going to create a survey that all stakeholders can, can take. So that's, and that's going to be happening shortly. We'll be sending that link out this week. So, you will be seeing all of the results, both for parents and the teachers. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Yeah, and so this is gonna be not anything about the principal, this is just a general question. Is there an IT person town-wide who manages Edline, or is each school responsible for their own? Because I, as you know, I like to look at a lot of websites and find information, and I find Joshua Eaton's website on Edline particularly lacking, and I think it would be a very low cost way to support some of your objectives of say posting, you know, if all of the elementary schools were like the way the middle school Edline websites are, like Coolidge, which I think is outstanding. You can look there and see what chapter they're on, who has tests, links to the books, and I don't, you see some of that in Killam, Birch Meadow doesn't have much, the, the websites really vary, and I think that would be a way we can all participate in, in in knowing, okay, geez, we're, we're behind another school, and you know, maybe that's gonna create more griping, but we'll know where we stand, we'll be able to access resources, as I think I blurted out earlier, most of us didn't get our math and focus passwords for the textbooks until a week or two ago. I did an informal Facebook survey and heard from two or three other schools that they weren't getting them either. Is there an IT person in town that ensures that all these passwords are ready? Because you, you guys paid a lot of money for this program. We should have had passwords on day one. So this sounds like something that we already have. Maybe Ms. Feeney can get the IT person to bring our website up to, up to par, or maybe there isn't somebody and she does it herself. I don't know. Thank you. We, we do not have a webmaster for the district. Um, each school is responsible for their own website, their own headline site. Okay. Um, in some buildings, it's the library media specialist. Other buildings, it is the building principal. Um, in, in, uh, in other buildings, it, it could be just a teacher. I'm not sure to even who you know, maintains the online site. Um, but we do not have a webmaster. You um, just need to be more informative. No, no, what I think what you're saying is the same thing I believe uh, Sherry Sher right? yeah. was saying, is consistency among all of the websites on what should be on there, like a standard. <coughs> and I think that as a way for parents to look to see, okay, the fourth grade is doing this this week, and this is what to look for, because it, the teachers don't even really use that line very much, I think. Maybe, they, maybe it varies. Thank you. As a high school parent, Edline is used a ton at the high school. I, I, I still don't think it's up to where we want to be at the elementary or probably even middle school level. At the high school level, I, I'm on it every single day, um, much to my kids' displeasure, but I, I think you will find that the high school is taking advantage of it 
and we, I agree with you that we do need to be more consistent across the elementary schools and it needs to be more of a focus. Thank you. This was, uh, this was incredible. Um, I, I have more notes than I, I, I know how to comment on right now. Uh, I will thank you. I, I, I do thank you. I think, um, I, I hope it's obvious that the committee has heard, heard you loud and clear. I hope it's obvious that you've heard the committee's commitment to this problem. Um, next steps are for the committee to digest what we've heard tonight to validate some of the things that we heard tonight because some of the things that we heard this evening was the first time that I'm speaking on for myself, was the first time I heard some of the things that I heard tonight and I need to digest it and figure out what our next step is. Uh, I don't want to leave it hanging in the air because I heard that as well. I heard that uh, there, there are people that feel as though we're making sort of this, well, we'll, we'll look at that and we'll get back to you. We will be getting back to you and I know that that's a vague statement. Thank you. Um, we have a few other items that we have on the agenda, believe it or not. Um, you're more than welcome to stay. You're more than welcome to go home and touch in the kids. Uh, thank you. So, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Thank so, you. We, have a, we have a few more agenda items. And we'll, uh, well, well uh, we have a second reading of the student field trip policy. I know that uh, Mr. Nye has been communicating with Mr. Do Dr. Dory, excuse me, uh, on some of it. I do believe uh, we finally have agreement on what we want the field trip policy to be. Uh, I'll ask yeah, Mr. Uh, Robinson to uh, begin reading, but I'm hoping someone interrupts him very quickly. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to wait for him to find me. He'll start off the fence with further reading. <laughs> I'm just trying to get to the in my tag. Yeah. Yeah. First time. Well, I'll read the motion first. Uh, uh, move to approve and accept the second reading of policy IJOA dash field trips. Is there a second? second. Thank you. <clears throat> academic uh, policy IJOA academic field trips. The Reading School Committee. Mr. Yes, this is that. Is, uh, the is there a second on suspension for the reading? Second. Great. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Uh, I don't think it's done for any changes from the last time. The one change that was made, and I'm looking for it, and I can't find it. Okay. Um, Thank you. We have a couple. Mr. Knight, do you have? Yeah, well, I know um, okay. you, you put a ratio in for uh, chaperones, and you also put in the uh, yes. field trip chaperone guide, which I think. It's, it's included in the, uh, in the package. Right. Those are the, those are the two changes. Great. Were there, yes. I just Dr. have a typo. <laughs> On the um, first page of the policy, actually, the next to last paragraph under educational alternatives, um, it says, in lieu of a field trip, can receive regular classrooms. It's just there's an extra D. D. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll remove the D. It's not a quality <laughs> comment. <laughs> Questions? Seeing none, 
Ready for a vote? All those in favor of accepting the policy as the bill should be? Great. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you. Mr. Robinson? We have a second reading of the bullying prevention policy. Policy JICFB. Move to approve and accept the second reading of policy JICFB bullying prevention. Is there a second? Thank you. Bullying uh, policy JICFB bullying prevention. The Reading Public Schools Committee. Is there a second? Vice President. Discussion? All those in favor of dispensing further reading? Motion carries 6 0. Sorry, uh, yes, Dr. Dory. Um, so I, there's, a, there's a few changes. It, basically, what you see is red line. Well, it's not red line in the packet, but um, we, I sent it back to, to um, our legal counsel with some suggestions that had been made, and our legal counsel gave comment, and then based on those comments, we made some, some changes. What you see are the red line versions of the changes that will go into this policy. Um, Remember the, the committee in the fall of 2013 had passed this policy and it was getting updated because there were some changes in the law. Thank you. So the red line will be added to the policy. Questions from the committee? My only comment would be that um, I know we have a, a bullying plan and I did look at it and it really looks like it needs to be updated. It's mentioned a curriculum. Probably stated this before. I'm not sure if I stated it publicly or just with Dr. Darty, but I do think it's an important um, key: uh, the social, emotional well-being of our students. That they're, um, you know, that learning is only going to be enhanced if they feel safe in school. So, um, I'm a strong advocate for working on uh, developing that type of atmosphere in each school. So, anything we can do to enhance or uh, improve that plan and make sure it's in place in every school. Um, Thank you. Further comment? Dr. Dobson? Um, I, first of all, I just want to say that I felt very listened to in this process. I know that I had some suggestions that were different, and there was a policy that was approved recently, but I was new to the committee and felt that I needed to, I couldn't vote on something unless I felt really good about it, and I made suggestions, and I felt very good about how the committee discussed the suggestions, and some were implemented and some were not, and some were changed, but that process, to me, it's analogous to what's going on in other, other realms with the schools, and so um, thank you for listening and for that process. Um, I wanted to point out that on page six, I numbered them, but it's under the notice of investigative Findings. I think it's just, um, I think we, unless I misunderstood, we missed it. But we're using the words target and aggressor. That's what the law The law says, but the law on, says, yeah. on this underlying piece, it actually uses the word victim. Yeah, that's not the term used in the law. So it should be target. I would say so. Is what I was thinking. Was that the law? That I, I get this so was put right by right our right. legal counsel and he vetted it and Okay. I was just surprised I don't that think it's significantly it's just a, I think it's something that um, it's just a better way to phrase victim and, and uh, sort of the practice that's in place now with bullying prevention program and that they would use that word target as opposed to victim. So I think it's that No, it's just there, so I thought it just was missed. Yeah. yeah, I think this was taken right from a state document. I think they missed it. <laughs> well, yeah. Would, uh, would the committee like to hold off voting on this until the next meeting and we can get clarification on that word? Oh, could the committee, oh, Do I I vote on that? I'm wondering if we could um, give permission for that word to be changed should the, if we vote on the policy and pass it with the caveat that if that 
that term should be legally changed, that that can sure. be done. The two words victim in that paragraph, it appears yes. twice. And the, and the reason it jumped out at me was because the point is that it's the behavior, it's not the person. So the aggressor is a person, he's not a bully. Any one of us can <coughs> behave like a bully. Sure. If Dr. Dory, I'm just, uh, my only comment is, if I, so if we can do what Dr. Docks are suggesting, that would be fine. I, I will have a conversation with okay. Attorney Joyce and we'll clarify ask him term. why he wrote it that way. But can, can we Yes, you change can. under, sure. you know, if, if the physical employer moves uh, to change a victim to target? I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll why don't the committee vote on the policy with the instruction that Dr. Doherty is going to make sure that uh, the two uses of the word victim are correct with our lawyer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Did you have further comments? Um, no, that was really Looking around, I don't see further questions. We're ready to take a vote. All those in favor of passing the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Dr. Doherty, for doing that. Um, we actually, um, Dr. Doherty, it, it's late, however, we're being recorded, so if you would like to still give you a report for this evening. I know we have some field trips and other stuff, but. Um, I believe Sorry if I jumped Mr. out. Mr. Chairman. Here. There's only about 10 minutes of space left on the memory card, just so you know. <laughs> and then it would be, then it, to say that then it would, sorry, then it would be cut off. And so I, I just, if Dr. Doherty has a longer report than that, I don't want it to be cut off. Thank you. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, well, we do have some field trips, which I know we would like to get to. Questions on the field trip? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, the, a wonderful and amazing are good. Yeah. Questions? Great. Vote on it. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Move to approve the annual RMHS drama field trip to New York City on May 16, 2015. Is there a second? Great. Questions? I'm not rushing, by the way. If there are questions, please ask. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Mr. Robinson? Uh, move to approve the RMHS Interact Club field trip to New York City on November 22nd, 2015. Is there a second? Second. Questions? Seeing another, oh, another awesome trip, great awesome service club. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Mr. Robinson? Move to accept the donation, the amount of $1,000 from the Friends of Reading Soccer to be used to support the coaching assistant position for the fall 2014 season. Is there a second? Second. Questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Mr. Robinson? Move to accept the donation in the amount of $10,655 from the Reading Band Is there a second? second? I'll throw out the uh, wow or wonderful, that's an amazing gift. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, uh, yes absolutely. Do we know how many coaches that covers? Ten. 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 Thank you. Further questions? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Move to accept the donation of two pieces of adaptive equipment valued at approximately $1,500 from uh, Bayes Closet to the Rise Free School. Is there a second? Second. second. Questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Uh, we have minutes. Mr. Robinson? Second? Second. Mrs. Doxer, other comments? No. <laughs> it was great. Awesome All those minutes. in favor of accepting the minutes? <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Awesome minutes and no typos. <laughs> um, our next meeting is November 
13th. Yes, the Thursday before town. The it's Thursday before, before, before town meeting. Six o'clock. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you then. Right, Mrs. Webb? Do I have any motions, Mr. Robinson? Uh, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Um, there was a vote there, right? There was a six-year vote. Oh,